Mound Assembly Committee Room 30. <coughs> Hello, the public gallery to Phil. Okay, can I advise those members of the public gallery that they are welcome to use mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and that all devices are muted. They can connect to the assembly Wi-Fi, password details of which are available on the gallery rules, and it is not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Okay, members, uh, anyone aware of apologies? No, no apologies. Okay, chairperson's business. Um, members, as agreed, uh, I, Robin Newton and William Humphrey met informally with officials from the Education Authority on Thursday the 27th of February and a complete record of exchanges are provided at page 22 of your meeting packs. I made some opening remarks indicated at this meeting indicating the Education Committee's concerns in respect of special educational needs provision special education needs transport issues, special school admissions, and general communication issues with EA. I reiterated the committee's previous request for open and transparent engagement, including a formal and open evidence session with the committee at the earliest possible opportunity, which is obviously taking place today. In response, the chief executive confirmed that she would brief the committee on the internal audit of practice in respect of SEND statements at our meeting today. In terms of the Department of Education, um, members will uh, recall that the committee previously wrote to the Education Authority indicating that we wanted the Chief Executive to appear before our committee to discuss such SEND matters. The EA had produced a response <coughs> to the committee's invitation and the Chief Executive had offered a briefing, a briefing date in March. However, the EA has advised that the Department of Education has lately obliged it to route all correspondence and papers through the Department of Education, which are intended for the committee. Consequently, and owing to some exchanges between the Education Authority and the Department for Education, no response was received by the Committee for Education, and members concluded that the Chief Executive of the Education Authority had failed to respond to our request. Members, if you are content, I propose that we write to the Minister of Education asking him to explain the rationale underpinning this new process for arm's length bodies with regards to corresponding with the Education Committee and, if necessary, uh, further to our consideration of that explanation to request that it be discontinued, uh, as this is a clear example of how it has caused a specific problem with regards to our engagement on a particularly important issue. Do, can I ask members' views in relation to that particular matter? Deputy Chair, Carmel. Chair, can you just remind the Department and the Minister that we wrote on the 5th of February asking exactly this and if we could get that clarity um, as soon as possible? Yeah. Members otherwise content <coughs> with that approach? Yep. Yeah. Okay then, members. The National Children's Bureau has uh, produced a report with regards to emotional health and wellbeing. Uh, the committee had sought sight of the NCB scoping report and the department published the report late last week, just after it had forwarded to the committee. The report is included in correspondence. Are members content to invite the NCB to come to the committee in order to brief the, on the report and discuss the report? Yeah. Agreed. 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 Okay. Can I also suggest to members that uh, the authors of the UNESCO Education Centre report on the Certificate of Religious Education be invited to brief the committee? Yep. Agreed. 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 Uh, members, can I also uh, advise the committee that we had agreed to meet informally with the Children's Law Centre on Tuesday the 10th of March in order to familiarise ourselves with key issues relating to the new special educational needs and disability framework? Related formal oral briefings from the Strategic Leadership Group and the Education Authority and the Department will be on the 11th of March, so the meeting has been arranged for next Tuesday, the 10th of March, at 1pm in the Members' uh, Dining Room.
members content with that, me, Karen? Yep. I need to give me apologies. I don't know about you, okay. but I checked and I read four other things at that time. No week. problem. I think the intention is for it to be in advance of yeah. the briefings on that Wednesday, so we will endeavour to get good written uh, notes of, of what is raised at that meeting to you. Content with that, yeah. Okay, members? Okay. Okay, then our joint meeting uh, with the department, or sorry, with the committee uh, for economy uh, on the Department of Economy 14 to 19 strategy. Can I ask the committee to formally agree that we hold a joint session with the committee for the economy on Wednesday, the 18th of March, 2020, <coughs> on the subject of the 14 to 19 strategy, and to have myself act as chairperson and Kiva Archibald who is chairperson of the Committee for the Economy, act as deputy chairperson for this joint session. Members content? Yeah, great. great. Okay. Okay, members, the draft minutes of the meeting of the 26th of February 2020 are available at page six. Can I seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. There are no matters arising, unless any members wish to raise any? No? Yeah, uh, Daniel? On the coronavirus issue, yeah. Well. yeah, is that yeah, is that coming up in any other agenda items, Clark? Or uh, intent okay, to? just to clarify, matters arising or matters which um, were raised at a previous meeting that have materialised yep, since. Yep, yep. So, is it a matter arising? Well, it was, or is it it was touched on in the last meeting, so I suppose it's relevant enough. Go ahead, Daniel. Uh, Chair, just in relation to the coronavirus, that there has been quite a number of uh, principals that have contacted me, and I'm sure other members. Uh, uh, panicked, quite panicked actually, about very little instruction coming uh, from EA or the Department of Education in relation to how they con should conduct themselves or uh, in terms of advice as to what precautions they could take to protect children and also the teaching workforce. And uh, I think it's important, Chair, that uh, this committee take an approach that uh, may, uh, may help action or, or um, uh, in some way assist principals, uh, particularly around school trips. Uh, because they're really in a state of limbo and not knowing what way to deal with it. But more importantly than that, uh, if a particular country that they travel to is quarantined whilst they're there, what is the legal implications of that for the school? Uh, what would the cost be in getting them back? Who would the cost fall on? These are all valid questions that have been posed to me by principals, particularly when you take the uniqueness of or Northern Irish issue, and that there's quite a number of people who have Irish passports, equally quite a number have British passports. What happens in that situation, Chair, uh, if children find themselves quarantined in a country? Um, and uh, also the significance of any potential legal challenge that could be posed in the event that a child is quarantined whilst on a school trip uh, and where the responsibility falls. There's a, a raft of questions that have been arisen. There's no answers to them. Uh, and uh, it's something that uh, principals and teachers are very, very concerned about, and so certainly something I suppose we'll raise with the education authority when they're invited to the table as well. Justin, just further to what Daniel's been saying, I've been speaking with a number of principals from my constituency. Also, I'm aware that there are 12 principals who are um, coordinating and writing that joint signing together a letter to the minister, which will be arriving on his desk today. Uh, concerned about the ambiguity, concerned about the lack of certainty, and really wants definitive guidance from the minister, from the, the first minister also. What do they do? Should they are they good to go? Are they safe to travel, or should they stay at home um, and have their travel costs covered? They want definitive guidance on that. So I uh, very much uh, like our our committee's view table that 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 guidance should be forthcoming. Okay, William, I would just make the point. Um, I would have thought on these issues, uh, I understand there was a, a meeting on Monday of the COBRA committee, which uh, all the regions, uh, uh, nations and regions were linked into, including ministers from here. Uh, the, the advice, surely, for the health minister, sorry, for the education minister, indeed all ministers should come initially from the health department, I would have thought. Um, and, and around those issues, the, the, the information has to be the information that's disseminated. There cannot be sure a variance between the, the information that we have here and the information that comes from from central government in London. So I would have thought that information <coughs> would have been imparted at the meeting uh, on Monday. Uh, if it isn't getting to schools, and obviously not just a, a only schools, but across society, that's an issue. I'm not suggesting it isn't, but I would have thought that the first protocol on that information in the department that has absolute responsibility for it initially is held. Okay. Any other members? Any brief points or questions? No? 
Okay. Sorry. Chair, yeah, no, Justin. That, that, that advice has been, you know, that, you know, notwithstanding the COBRA meeting, um, the advice still hasn't been forthcoming as to whether it is safe to travel. They're saying the decision is still with the principals to make, and this needs to be come down to a policy, a public policy matter. The decision should be with the minister of education or with the, the first minister and deputy first minister. A one size fits all, can you? Mm -hmm. Italy, Italy is the epicenter of the coronavirus on this continent. Uh, we've cancelled the, the rugby game on this island, and the, the France uh, rugby game is also in question. And we are yeah, no, no, it's we are being ambiguous about this. There needs yeah. to be certainty and clarity from from the top. Yeah, if, so. Can can the clerk remind us of what actions we've taken to date in terms of seeking clarity around this from the Chair department? Person, we've written to the department already, um, asking for clarity on the school trip issue. But I can write again, um, just seeking uh, indicating that the advice hasn't been uh, unambiguous advice hasn't been forthcoming yet, and asking the department for when that's going to be and what it's going yeah. to be. Chair. There obviously needs to be coordination at the very least between departments. And the minister for health obviously gave an updated statement to the assembly this week where he referenced. Um, close participation with the Department for Education and the Minister for Education. Um, I think the fact that questions are still being asked, though, does suggest that some clarity from the Minister for Education, even if it is to advise what advice he has taken from the Minister for Health, is, is put into the public domain. I think the key issues here is advice to schools about containment practice, travel guidance, and what practical support is available to them. And I asked them at the Assembly during the Minister for Health statement whether um, this advice had been co communicated direct with schools, because it's one thing to say, look at websites or whatever, but I think as members have raised that schools are obviously uh, a population of, of particular relevance here. So um, if we can reiterate that request for urgent confirmation that schools have been clearly advised as to con best containment practice and travel guidance and members be content to consider the response once received. I think it's Daniel. important to be identified whose responsibility it is to actually advise the schools uh, because this is where the confusion seems to lie and the principals that I've spoken to and I've had significant emails in the last week in relation to it and phone calls. The uh, principals are saying that any contact they've had with the EA, for instance, they're saying, well, it's up to the individual principal of that school. In my opinion, given the, the numbers of schools that we have across Northern Ireland, that is not an appropriate approach to something that is uh, as important as this particular issue, uh, particularly when it's the health care of our children. The Department of Education, certainly the Education Authority, have a responsibility to ensure that principals and teachers are protected, the schools are protected, and that they're given proper and accurate advice as to the steps that are taken, and also that there will need to be an element of funding provided to schools to ensure that in the case of an infection, for instance, as an example, that there, what happens if a school needs uh, cleaned down? Who, who pays for that? Where does the cost fall? Does it fall to the school? Because certainly in line with the budgets that they currently are so struggling with, uh, that wouldn't be an appropriate course. So there needs to be a clear questions asked of, in the event of an outbreak of a particular school, what happens in terms of uh, decontaminating that school, who's responsible for the cleaning costs of that school, uh, and also for the, any cost incurred in relation to this virus on a particular school. That's all the questions that principals are asking. And uh, can I say, Chair, that when they have contacted EA, uh, more than three principals this week have told me they've been most unhelpful in terms of providing guidance to them in relation to this, uh, what is soon to become a pandemic. Yeah, they're ensuring that schools have had full and proper advice and support is absolutely vital. Members are content we will re-request that urgent clarity. And if, if not content with the response, um, I, I'd be content to request that a uh, lead senior official from the Department of Education come to the committee in order to orally brief on those matters and or take questions if members still feel that the lack of clarity has provided by the time we get to next Wednesday, because this is obviously an emerging Just very quickly, issue. Chair, yeah, the, Justin, the, go ahead. There's schools scheduled to travel on Saturday. That yeah. okay. well, that, that's why I'm saying we obviously overnight. need an urgent written response. Um, if for any reason we're not content with that, then I think we move to request an, an oral presentation on the matter from a, a lead senior official or the minister. Members content with that? Yeah. Okay. Moving on then, members, to agenda item five, uh, our Education Authority oral briefing on the 
audit report of the SEN assessment and statementing process. Can I refer members to the following documents? Our clerk's cover note on the SEN statementing at page 14. Education Authority briefing paper at page 27. SEN code of practice at page 33 and departmental correspondence regarding the education and health SEN cooperation working group at page 131. Can I remind members again that uh, it is not the committee's role uh, to interact with ongoing HR processes in arms like bodies, particularly where this may expose the committee or individual members to the legal consequences of prejudicing those processes or violating the privacy or rights of individuals. I would also advise members that consequently um, require us to focus on the key issues um, before us, uh, namely the extremely important matter of the special educational needs statementing process. Uh, can I welcome the Education Authority Chief Executive, Sarah Long, the Assistant Director for Pupil Services and Procurement at the Education Authority, Ms Donna Allen and Ms. Cynthia Curry, Head of Transformation at the Education Authority. Uh, you're very welcome today. Um, in terms of brief opening remarks from uh, myself, this Education Committee has obviously received and expressed profound concern for the Education Authority SEN provision <coughs> over many years. That includes the complexity and the delay of the SEN statementing process and therefore access to SEN support for children and young people in Northern Ireland and indeed their families. It also includes the way in which Belfast Special School area planning was handled, instances of non-verbal children with special educational needs being left behind on EA transport, excessive journey times for EA transport, lateness to school and even being dropped off to wrong addresses. I personally submitted a petition signed by over 6,000 parents and guardians to the Minister for Education in opposition to the Education Authority, Children and Young People Services attempt to reduce say, nursery hours to part-time provision. So these are matters that this Education Committee has had extreme concern for. Um, I would, however, remind us all, as has been mentioned in, in our, our pre-meeting today, that our guiding responsibility today is to deliver openness, transparency and answers for children in Northern Ireland with special educational needs, for their parents and guardians and the teaching and non-teaching staff working to support them. So we welcome your presence here today and we look forward to working to secure that outcome for children with special educational needs this morning. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. <coughs> First of all, I'd like to thank the committee for this opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the findings of our audit of practice in special education and specifically the current statutory assessment process. I know from speaking to parents, children and principals since I was appointed as Chief Executive in April 2019 that the statutory assessment and statementing journey is a critical process for all involved. It is a highly complex area but it is one where it is essential that the processes exist to meet the needs of individual children at all times. As the audit report has found, however, this has not always been the case, and we have identified significant shortcomings in how the Education Authority has managed this process. This morning I want to share those findings with the Committee to detail the recommendations and demonstrate that measures have already been implemented which are having a positive impact upon those who have been waiting too long for the statementing process to be completed. It is my intention to provide the full report to the committee at the appropriate time, and I understand the committee's frustration that I am unable to do so today. However, we have provided a briefing document, and I can outline the salient findings and recommendations. We are also happy to return to the committee to, to discuss the full report. Much of the work that my colleagues do at EA is excellent and we are committed to creating an organisation which is focused at, on putting the needs of children to the fore of everything that we do. That undertaking to change is already underway and since becoming Chief Executive we are now delivering across a range of work streams. For example, leading together with school principals through locality net leadership networks, 
improving communications, the introduction of the new health and wellbeing strategy and coaching programmes for principals and the introduction of an online admissions process for parents and schools. However, as the findings of the audit demonstrate, we have fallen short of the high standards we set for ourselves and which children and families deserve, particularly in respect of the current statutory assessment process for special educational needs, which has left too many children waiting too long for the process to complete. From a strategic perspective, the report has identified a number of issues relating to information governance, compliance with timeframes <coughs> and unnecessary and undue delays in the statutory assessment process. My colleague Donna Allen, who led the audit and is the Assistant Director of Pupil Services and Procurement with responsibility for business improvement, will detail the audit's key findings and the actions that EA is already taking to urgently address these shortcomings. The audit of practice found that 85% of pupils did not complete the statementing process within the 26-week statutory period. In reality, that meant that at the time of the analysis in November 2019, there were over 1,000 children who had exceeded the statutory time frame. I want to make clear that these delays are unacceptable. They have caused distress and worry for families and they have delayed the provision of appropriate services to children with special educational needs. On behalf of the Education Authority, I would like to apologise to the families affected and assure them that measures are underway to address the problem. In response to the report, my colleague Cynthia Curry, a seconded school principal, is leading a dedicated improvement team. Cynthia can address any questions you have in regard to those improvements but the key actions include focusing resources on those children who have been waiting for the longest period, identifying reasons for the delay and expediting the process. We are also committed to the creation of a more child-centred service. While there is still some way to go, good progress is being made. And since November, there has been a 36% reduction in the number of children who have been waiting beyond the 26 weeks. When I was appointed Chief Executive in April 2019, the Education Authority's Children and Young People's Services launched a Special Education Transformation Action Plan. When term began in 2019, however, I commissioned this audit to provide an independent overview of how the statementing process was being delivered and to assess performance. I wish to pay credit to my colleagues who have worked extremely hard to provide good practice in challenging circumstances but the current system has not delivered because of poor process on EA's behalf and because there has not been a culture of proactive, proactively managing statutory assessments. Changing that culture requires a systematic change in focus towards robust management and accountability throughout every stage <coughs> of the statementing process. I am sorry that this has not been the case but through the implementation of the report's recommendations, we are making practical changes that are beginning to deliver improvements. As the Chief Executive, I want to work with the Committee, the Department and the Minister to deliver on our strategic priorities. We are doing so across the majority of our services, but I acknowledge that there are challenges ahead in this area. Changing culture and process is not something that can be achieved overnight, but we have started. And I commit to the committee to updating them in due course on the targets that we will set for ourselves and on our ongoing progress against those targets. I will ask Donna, who was the author of the report, to now describe some of the main findings and recommendations to you. Thank you. Um, I suppose just it would be helpful for the committee, first of all, maybe just to talk about um, myself and the team that led this piece of work. So uh, the Chief Executive asked us to, to do this piece of work in September uh, 2019, and I formed a team, and as Sarah has already said, I'm the AD responsible for set continuous improvement within the Education Authority. I've had considerable experience and, and have a background in leading improvements and service improvements, particularly in health, um, as an Assistant Director there for seven years. Um, targeted at uh, improvements around statutory timeframes. 
the team that I formed um, had a wide range of skills uh, in terms of being able to carry out an effective audit. Uh, it comprised of members that had expertise in process and system re redesign, digital transformation, information governance, management information and the use of management information to drive service development and also service development within the Children and Young People's Services Directorate. Um, as the Chief Executive has outlined, we were asked to carry out an audit of the current administrative practices associated with the statutory statement and process within the Education Authority. Key areas that we, we were going to look at um, were information governance, compliance with time frames, and particularly commencement of time frames, and en any unnecessary and undue delay. As the Chief Executive has outlined, uh, the Children and Young People's Services already had a Special Education Transformation Action Plan and we were asked to review the effectiveness uh, of that action plan and was it having the desired impact in terms of improving the process for children and young people. The key findings of the audits um, were we found that the current statutory assessment process is highly manual and administrative and there appeared to be a number of unnecessary and undue delays in the operation of this process across all same teams in the authority. However, there were varying degrees of that. There was found to be a lack of management focus or accountability on the importance of the 26-week statutory assessment time frame. This appeared to be driven by the perception that the achievement of this time frame was not possible and therefore cases were often managed in a reactive manner rather than proactively in order to meet the time scales for children. The audit team also found that the interpretation and handling of valid exceptions which are in the legislation was a key factor in this area. Valid exceptions, there are, num there are seven valid exceptions contained within the legislation and they range for things that um, the school is closed for a period of time and therefore education authority staff couldn't correspond with schools to move statements on. Perhaps the child could be out of the country. There are, so as I said, there's seven of these. However, we found as a team that valid exceptions once applied, they didn't seem to be uh, managed in a proactive manner. Routine standardised management information reports are not systematically and routinely produced or used for senior management to monitor operational performance or drive improvements. Consequently, senior management do not currently or did not currently have a comprehensive overview of which children in their respective offices were waiting the longest time for the completion of their statutory assessment. The audit team was informed that there was no consistency in the current practice around the formal clock start of the statutory assessment time frame. However, we found evidence that previously that had not been the case. There, is, there was uncertainty on the length of time taken for the provision of support for children specified in their statement. This may be due to late referrals to the transport department or delays in the implementation of classroom assistant resource. This timeline is not currently monitored and may result, the audit team felt, this may result in further unhidden delays once the statement had been issued. The authority operates a statutory assessment panel, and that is part of phase one of the actual statement and process where decisions are made on, on whether a child should proceed into the statement and process. Each office appeared to operate in its own silo, and there was limited evidence of cooperation or sharing of good practice across the five offices. The audit team had concerns around the operation of the statutory assessment panel um, and some of the decisions made in that panel. There were issues relating to the performance, functionality and reliability of our Capita One system, which is our main management information system, which impacted on staff and their ability to effectively operate the statement and process. The current accommodation provided for some of the teams was not appropriate in terms of information governance. The audit team did find areas of good practice linked to a number of offices. But this, we felt this was attributed more to individual staff working to the very best of their ability in challenging circumstances rather than evidence of proactive and effective management. The team did recognise that staff felt that they were working to the best of their ability in often difficult and demanding circumstances, dealing with very challenging and emotive requests and queries from parents, public representatives and or legal challenges. The team found that the majority of these queries and requests appear to be due to the delay in the current statement and process. 
Following those, rec those findings, the audit team um, compiled 10 recommendations, um, and there, those recommendations range from a change in culture in terms of the service, moving to much more proactive and rigorous um, managing of the statement process. We've recommended that there needs to be a new EA-wide model to include greater accountability and monitoring of performance. We have a recommendation that we need to review our Capital One management information system and to put robust, robust management around that. The current staffing structure needs to be reviewed in terms of some of the unnecessary and undue delays. We need to review the, the implementation and the valid exceptions and how we as authority implement those. We've recommended that the SAP panel, the statutory assessment panel, and district tribunal decisions are reviewed in depth and learning is taken from those. We need further cross directorate working between special education services, transport, human resources, and other areas within the authority. We need to review our existing accommodation in terms of information governance and our records management and file storage arrangements. And the organ, um, our final recommendation is that the, or, the authority learns from the lessons in this audit and that we transfer them to other services. Following the, the recommendations, and I know Sarah has alluded to this, and, and Cynthia will go into it in more detail, there has been a very comprehensive and robust improvement plan that covers all of our recommendations and has a number of work streams. Cynthia speaking to those, yeah. I've yeah. Not yet. yeah. Um, so, since the audit of practice, then, in picking up on Donna's point of the 10 recommendations, um, we have put together a comprehensive action plan, and that action plan has a series of work streams, each with work stream leads. Um, the team um, to action the plans, led by myself, I'm a seconded uh, school principal. Uh, my background might be um, of interest to a committee. I have been teaching for 25 years and um, I'm currently principal post-primary non-selective education. So through that time I have been uh, working with many young people and families um, who have had special educational needs and have had significant barriers to learning. Um, it is essential, therefore, that any improvements going forward take into account that we must be a more front-facing service and we must provide assurances and build the trust of um, the communities and, indeed, the children, young people, schools and families. Um, with that in mind, therefore, the immediate actions around the action plan have been focused on children as individuals and our first um, actions in the last um, number of weeks that we have been working with the staff around offices has been to look at each individual case. Our focus has been on the longest open cases. Um, we understand that this can be a very difficult process for young people uh, going through this and for some children that has been a very prolonged process. So we've been hearing the stories, looking at the stories, looking at the cases of each of those young people and trying to understand what the undue delays have in, in each case and trying to expedite the process and in trying to ensure that we can uh, remove any barriers to the statement and process uh, being uh, concluded for those young people. We have made some uh, improvements um, in that. Obviously, um, we've been focusing on those outside the 26-week framework but that is not to the detriment of those are now entering the state mending process. We have around each office a particular uh, a member of staff um, dedicated to looking at the backlog of the longest open cases, but that does not take away from business as usual in the offices. We've also been working alongside the staff to look at uh, capacity of the staff, and I would have to endorse uh, what Donna has said about a very hard-working frontline staff. Um, who are under tremendous challenges and one of the things that we have found as a team as we've went in is the openness to improvement and the real commitment uh, by staff to um, work with the team in reviewing the processes. Um, there is no doubt that we have had to and we will look at accountability uh, in each of the offices and working across offices and we are looking at the processes so that we can uh, further streamline uh, the work that the staff currently uh, undertake in each of those offices. 
The improvement plan will also include more longer term uh, improvements, such as partnership working with other services, um, such as looking at um, uh, gaining feedback, proactive feedback uh, from children, young people, families. Uh, looking at this as a, as a very administrative process, so we're looking at how digitalisation might be able to help staff further and also to look at performance across the Education Authority as a whole and um, have some of the learning points that are coming out from um, this audit of practice in this particular service. Okay. Officials, anything else to add at this stage? No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, to to summarise some of those findings, then, um, unnecessary and undue delay in the EA assessment and statementing of support for children with special educational needs, a lack of management focus and accountability, a lack of managerial performance monitoring, limited evidence of management meetings, and correct interpretation of valid exception reasons for delay, failure to accurately record assessment timescales and time taken to provide support for children with special educational needs, delayed provision of appropriate transport and classroom assistance support, information governance issues risking the integrity of highly sensitive information held about children with special educational needs, and some good practice attributable to individual staff working in challenging circumstances, but not proactive, effective management. Uh, whilst there has been uh, chronic under-resourcing of education in recent years and an, an absence of the type of reform necessary to respond to that, um, I, the findings uh, of this audit of the Education Authority SEN assessment and support process are shocking, but they also confirm the profound and long-held concerns of parents with special educational needs across Northern Ireland and indeed this Education Committee. So I, I put to you that the findings of this report present for whatever reason and that's what we have to establish. The development of a, a culture of delay, non-compliance and a lack of accountability, and perhaps most importantly, a systemic failure of children with special educational needs by the Education Authority. Is that a fair assessment? I think they are very serious findings, and I do take them very seriously. And as I said in my opening statement, I am um, absolutely confirm that they fall short of what children and young people should expect from the services that we deliver. Um, the audit has identified, as you've outlined, a number of systemic issues, um, and we want to move forward now to improve those issues. Okay. And, and of, of most concern is, how was such a culture and systemic failure allowed to develop? I suppose it's a complex process um, and it's a difficult um, assessment to make now as to what happened in the past. And what we can say is we are clear that moving forward this will become a child-centred service. It, it, is, um, it is easy, if you like, to see this as an administrative process. It is not an administrative process. It is a process that is in place to support children and families um, to access the services that they need. Um, and certainly in terms of the feedback that I have heard directly from parents and that I have heard from school principals, some of it supports that feedback and it is important that we move that forward now and that we change that to a very child-centred approach to this. Okay, and, and as the Executive Committee responsible for the governance and accountability of the Education Authority, what is the Education Authority Boards and the Education Authority Board Children and Young People Services Subcommittee response to this systemic failure of children with special educational needs? So the Education Authority Board has been informed of the findings um, and recommendations of the report, as have the committee here today, and the Children and Young People Services Committee have as well. They are uh, seeking um, urgent updates from us now in terms of the impact of the improvements 
Um, they are committed to the recommendations that we have made, and they are fully committed to the full implementation of those recommendations and moving forward to demonstrate, not just to describe, but to demonstrate that we are improving this process and that we are making it more child-centred. Okay, uh, and is this culture of mismanagement and delay and systemic failure within the EA confined to the area of special educational needs? Well, the audit um, that was undertaken was specifically in this area, and it was specifically in this area on the basis of, this, of the feedback um, that we had received about this area. Um, I can't say at this point in time that every single service right across the EA is operating to its maximum efficiency and effectiveness, but what I can say is that that I do not receive the same level of feedback um, across those other services as, as I do on this. Is a, a full independent review of the Education Authority now required to restore public confidence in your organisation? Well, we are in the process of developing our own performance management framework and arrangements that will come forward through our board where we will be able to easily and clearly identify the issues. Um, Again, I believe that we have had a, a, a focus on the structures of um, education for, for a very long time, and I would like moving forward that we focus on the services that we provide to um, children and young people, to the standard to which we provide them and the quality to which we provide them. Um, I believe the audit in itself shows that the Education Authority can be and is um, holding its own self to account, that it is coming forward with its own recommendations and that that is a start um, and that we will demonstrate improvement against those um, recommendations and that should help restore confidence in the authority. Okay. I have just a few more questions before I bring members in. Um, you, the findings refer to serious information governance risks. Have there been GDPR breaches and has the Information Commissioner been informed, if so? Um, this is an area, as you all know, and that we are dealing with lots and high volume of um, personal information. So in a, in a service of that area, or that size and scale, there will at times be uh, information governance breaches. Um, any breach that we're aware of that is serious or whatever, uh, would be would be reported if we believe it is serious enough to warrant we would report those to the information commissioner's office and have there been reports to the information commissioner's office further to this audit uh, or during? Been, no we've been corresponding with the information commissioner we had some questions around the service and we've been corresponding with them and we have provided them an assurance that we have done a thorough audit of practice and that we have uh, a number of recommendations to take forward in terms of improving any risks around information governance in this that's area, and this is included in the action plan and the improvement plan going forward. So the Information Commissioner's Office has been assured that we have investigated, um, that we have highlighted any issues that are uh, would make potentially be a risk, and that we have an action plan to address those. Okay. Uh, how many children's records were found to be incorrect? <coughs> Sorry, in terms of in terms of inaccuracies or we, we, we didn't obviously look at all there's twenty two thousand children in the system so we didn't look at all. Um, so some of those inaccuracies may just have been about in terms of the date of referral and the date recorded on the system. So um, that might have been some of the inaccuracies, but it did there were some inaccuracies in the records that we reviewed. Okay. You 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 state that eighty five percent of assessments were beyond the statutory deadline of 26 weeks, totaling 1,000 children. Um, what, what reasons were provided for those statutory breaches? I suppose all of the reasons and all of the findings in the audit. Um, there, is, there is a number of reasons, and uh, as, as an audit team, we found a number of unnecessary and undue delay, and I've outlined a number of those this morning. So I, I suppose I couldn't say for what, what particular reason. There were a number of reasons, systemic reasons, for those okay. delays. And, and how, how many remain outside the 26 weeks deadline as of today? So as of today, um, that figure has reduced to... Um, Get the figure. Um, 676. So there was a thousand, and it's reduced to 676. Do you have an idea of the the level of 
delay beyond the 26 weeks for, for those? Yes, yeah, yeah. we would. We, like the, as, the, the average length of time, the longest length of time. Yeah, as Cynthia said, you know, we are, we are looking at, and her team is looking at individual children. So every and every child that is over 26 weeks has been looked at in detail. Um, and currently, um, our longest wait is over 100 weeks. And that has reduced considerably. So almost two years. Their children potentially with special educational needs in need of special educational needs support and early intervention waiting up to two years for assessment and support. Okay. Um, okay, keen to know as well what what the impact of that lack of support could be, but conscious I need to bring other members in as well. So allow me to do that and we can return to the, the detail. Um, Robin Newton. Thank you, Chair, and I, I welcome the delegation coming to, to see us today. And I think the Chairman has already indicated um, this is just a shocking situation. There really isn't any other description that one could could could, could put upon it. Um, and uh, I kind of feel now that in many ways I have sat in my constituency office and been contacted by parents and believing that when you take up the issue on behalf of a child that indeed when it goes into the system those queries were being handled professionally and we now feel now find that there was little or no professionalism attached to the 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 the, the, the work that was being done and I'm sure that there are the folk engaged in this are not going into the office to do a bad job. I'm sure they want to do a, a good job. But the chair has already indicated in that phrase, which is so concerning, s systemic uh, problems in the system. You know, it really just is is uh, is really uh, appalling. I just. Uh, I do want to try to be positive out of this, uh, rather than just dwell only on the negative. And perhaps you could uh, out, outline, um, in terms of the, the, the uh, backlog, um, uh, when you think that that backlog will be, the 600, the thousand that's reduced to 626, when will that 626 be addressed and brought into line? And indeed then, would that mean that every child or as close as possible to every child entering the system would be dealt with within the 26 week period? And what communication has now taken place with the parents of the children? Um, uh, of those uh, children affected. And I have to say that the phrase that uh, has been used and has been used in this room previously, you know, what does a child-centred service actually mean in this context? And we've had that phrase used, used before, that we're entering into a child-centred. And I suppose you, your key findings and then related to the recommendations. There isn't one of the recommendations that is in any way complex. They're not complex recommendations. They're fairly simple and really should be in the, the culture within uh, uh, any sort of performance monitoring uh, role of uh, person in, in the department. And educate authority. Uh, so uh, I'm not, I'm just worried about when we're going to see the matter put to bed. You could. Okay, okay. thanks, Robin. Well, um, 
In terms of um, the Cynthia's team and the improvement team, their immediate priority has been those children who have been waiting longest in their statementing journey who are currently within the system. Um, and that has been their focus, if you like, in terms of reducing that backlog and reducing the number of children waiting. Um, alongside that, the uh, the longer term action plan is around making sure that we do not then find ourselves back in this position. But we do understand that this is going to take time um, and we do appreciate and, and feel at this point that it may take um, additional resource as well. Um, and that is the work that the team are currently doing. So at this point in time, we haven't profiled um, our full conclusion as to when we will reach the end, but certainly that is part of the um, performance improvement metrics that I have committed to sharing with the committee and bringing back to the committee and sharing our performance against those metrics with the committee. Um, uh, there are some immediate things to attend to, some shorter term things to attend to, and some uh, longer term things to attend to. Um, do you want to say something about this? child-centred service in the Yes, plan. absolutely. To pick up on that point, what a child-centred service looks like. Um, I suppose there are multiple aspects to that, but it is that the service uh, begins with the child. Too often we begin with the system and try to work it around the child. So we begin with the child and we work the system to that. We look at the needs of the child and we look at the needs of the child and their wider family. Um, and we've got to get better at asking uh, children and young people for their views. And um, we need to find from those who have been in the system, we need to get feedback in the near future as to the key frustrations they have found um, with the service. And we use that to find solutions for this service going forward. But it is also for those young people who come into the statementing process that there is proactive advice and guidance as to what the uh, journey for the young person uh, may look like. Um, and ultimately then it is about um, when a statement um, is issued, it's making sure that the young person gets the provision um, in a timely manner and gets the right provision um, for their individual needs. So in my opinion, as a, as a practitioner, it is beginning with the child and making the systems work for the child's needs rather <coughs> than the other way around. And that's how I would intend to take improvement. Could I just ask you, in terms of the communication that has taken place with the parents now, what has happened? Well, in each of the individual cases, obviously, in the same manner that statementing would uh, take place, there would be, at the end of a process, or when a process is cl closing out, there'd be opportunity to get back to the parent and to discuss uh, with them their particular case, and that would be where officers are, officers are at at the moment in terms of um, their correspondence with um, children and their families. Um, but what we'd also be saying, um, there is a helpline um, available for those who are going through uh, the process and that would be available for parents who continue to be uh, concerned in relation to any of the issues that have been discussed today. Uh, and the parents of the 626 that are still to be, are you in communication with those parents? Well, in going through the process, there would be various communication. Um, I think probably it would be fair to say that um, one of the processes that we find that um, would have shortcomings around it has been the communication with parents. And certainly, as we look forward, this needs to be a, a more front-facing uh, service, and it needs to be a service that does communicate more proactively with the parents. In terms of the last three to four weeks that we have been involved, there hasn't been a general communication to that group as of yet. Sure. Well, thank you, Rob. I some important questions there. Um, first off, there are obviously parents and guardians of children with special education needs across Northern Ireland that will receive this shocking news today. Do you have a, a clear message to those parents in particular, who will be distressed by what they're hearing today? Yes, Chair, um, I think, as I, I reiterate um, from my opening remarks, um, 
the service that we have provided has fallen short of their expectations and it has fallen short of the standard that we should have delivered and I will reiterate my apology for that and we are working through those cases on, a, on an individual case by case basis and that is, is, is how we are then making contact with parents um, directly on a case by case basis however as Cynthia has highlighted we do have a helpline available if parents are concerned or in distress um, that they can make contact in terms of, of their case if we haven't been at the point where we have made individual contact with them. Okay. Can I just seek clarification as well? I had perhaps inaccurately recorded the number of outstanding cases beyond 26 weeks as 676? 676. 676, okay. Um, and in terms of the helpline, can I, I, I seek some reassurance as to the adequacy of that helpline because we do have previous experience of helplines being put in place to respond to difficult situations and exacerbating the problem rather than helping that. So is that helpline adequately resourced and will a parent who is a guardian distressed by today's news have timely access to uh, uh, a trained person to respond to those concerns? They will, yes. Yeah. We will keep that under review, however, Chair, get, be, on the basis of the volume of calls, and if we need to adjust that, then we will adjust that. Okay. I'd also be interested in hearing the, the t intended time scales for um, processing the outstanding um, assessment cases, but maybe someone else will cover that in their questions as well, so I'll move on to <coughs> Daniel McCrossan. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to Donna, Sarah and Cynthia for their uh, presentation and contribution and insight. Um, like many today uh, around this table, we have heard for months, if not years, from principals, teachers, parents, about how let down they, they feel by EA. And what I've heard today is nothing short of chaotic, shocking, reckless, dysfunctional, utter failure in terms of how EA has conducted itself in relation to something as vitally important as our children with special education. Complete maladministration and it needs to be addressed with complete urgency. And I know, Sarah, since you've come into place that you are taking this seriously and it's a very difficult to handle and it will take time but I can tell you from what you're telling me today there's, there's not just shortcomings these children have been failed this is not just a slight fall in standards this is complete failure on the part of EA in the interest of these children and parents and teachers and principals and I think if we're to find any starting point, that's where it should be in order to rectify some of the issues that are there. The audit that was carried out, it was carried out by auditors, and, and just clarifying that, was it? No. no. Donna had outlined, I think, in her presentation yeah. in terms of the skill set of the yeah. team. It was okay. very specifically around uh, business improvement and information governance expertise and um, process yep. systems. systems. G given the breakdown in trust and confidence in terms of parents, teachers, principals in the Education Authority. I'd go further to suggest that if this is the result of a, an audit that was carried out by the Education Authority of itself in terms of SEM, that there should be an independent review of the entire organisation particularly after what you've just told us today. This is children we're talking about, and I know that you appreciate the seriousness of this and the challenge of the task ahead. But I can tell you from the principals, teachers and parents that I have spoken to and other members around this table, every time I am at a principal's office or with a teacher or a parent, the finger is firmly pointed towards the Education Authority in terms of the feelings that they are finding continually. And I've noted the helpline. The amount of teachers and principals have told me that any time they lift the phone seeking any form of support from the Education Authority, they're oft, often left wanting in that regard. The biggest challenge for the Education Authority seems to be 
around communication, a lack of it completely, with outside of the organisation. A lack of communication in schools between principals, teachers, and also in this instance with parents. That's where the big issue is. In terms of the special education needs, just to clarify so that we're clear in the room, who is responsible now for statementing of children? Responsibility for um, the statutory operations process now rests with Una Turbot. Okay. And Una reports directly to me now on that issue. And when was that appointment made? It was a, not an appointment, it was a temporary reallocation of duties. Okay. And for special schools? Ruth Bell is responsible for special schools, reporting through the Education Directorate to Michelle Corky, who took up post on Monday. And again, is that a new, is that a temporary position? Temporary reallocation of duties. Okay. Thank you. And just, just in terms of something the Chair touched on, and Chair, if you give me some grace with us. Um, the news broke around September uh, of the uh, issue around date stamping uh, correspondence that came in in relation to uh, children. And I, I'm just reading here, a man who claimed to have worked on the cases for two months told the BBC that he was directed not directed not to date stamp letters as it, would, as it would constrain the authority to respond within a certain time frame. Now, if this audit has been carried out, what are the findings of that audit in this regard? Was someone or persons who were charged with that role directed deliberately not to date stamp that correspondence? Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the areas that we were asked to look at um, and uh, I suppose the first thing as an audit team we wanted to be assured of is that that was not the current practice uh, and uh, we were assured and found evidence that the practice now uh, and the practice that we observed when we were doing the audit was that there is no manipulation of the clock start as we, we would describe it so uh, we had uh, and we uh, investigated this issue considerably. However, what we did find was that historically there was evidence to suggest, and I don't know why staff were doing that, but there was evidence to suggest that the date that the referral was received was not the date that was recorded on the system. I can't comment on why that was the case, but there was evidence that that had previously been the case in a number of uh, children's um, But we were, we, we were assured that that is no longer the case. Across all offices. I'm uh, glad to hear that it's no longer the case. My concern is why it was the case to begin with, because a whistleblower has claimed who has worked on this particular uh, for EA that he or she, he in this case, was directed uh, not to date stamp them. Now, that's a very serious situation, and it also begs questions of the review that has been carried out in terms of its independence to properly get to the crux of the situation. That is a serious situation. And if we're to instill confidence in the Education Authority in relation to this, there needs to be clarity around around us. So uh, just to be clear, are we saying that the audit found that there was no direction given by anyone in a senior position not to date stamp, or anyone for that matter, these documents, or there was? I suppose we, we weren't able to talk to that individual, so we couldn't talk about that particular instance. What we as a team were very clear about was, first of all, being assured that that was no longer the case. So that was we needed to be able to assure the chief executive that there was no, no that was not happening in the organisation now. But what we did do, or what we did find, was that there was evidence that suggested that that had been the practice. Now, why it was the practice, I can't comment, because we weren't able to talk to that individual. But we had there was evidence to show that some referrals had been date stamped, and the date recorded in that date stamp was different from the, 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 what had been previously recorded on the system. I think maybe just to say that, I mean, we take, I mean, any concerns of malpractice or, or any accusations in that space incredibly seriously and that is why the audit team 
were specifically directed to examine that particular allegation um, as well. So it was a, it was a, a very specific um, piece of the, the, the audit um, to make sure and, and examine that allegation um, and to bring a conclusion forward on it. So considerable attention was paid mm -hmm. to it as part of the audit. And do you accept that there has been failings in that regard by the Education Authority? Can I well, supplement that, Daniel, as well? Is, is the, the failure to accurately date stamp an assessment from date of referral an offence as part of a statutory process? No, I don't think it's, it's an offence okay. as such. I, I wouldn't believe so. Um, it's, not an, it's not an offence, no. Okay. What, However, what type we would of... recognise that it's not good practice um, and that it's not um, how we would want things to be. Um, but again, it is one area that um, the audit were assured that ha has, all, has already been attended to and that they have evidence that it was being routinely done in the correct way. Uh, and what... Given that it's not an offence, what is the accountability mechanism in response for someone doing that? Well, that would be a line management issue, um, but it would be a line management issue that we now need to set in the context of the changes that we are making moving forward um, so that everyone is clear around what their expectations are and that there's absolute clarity around what we expect. Can I ask without, sorry Daniel, to supplement again, without prejudice to any proceedings and if it does then uh, obviously don't proceed but why were you unable to talk to the individual that alleges they were directed not to date stamp letters? They didn't come forward to anonymous. us. And you didn't approach them? They were anonymous. They were anonymous. Okay. Um, Okay, Dan, you want to proceed there? Thank yeah, you. Just to follow on, Chair, the said individual acknowledged that staff in the department worked hard, which I have no doubt about. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, but he also said that files were very poorly organised, with many going missing and no prioritisation given to very urgent cases. That's a shocking statement uh, that was revealed by a whistleblower. And thank you to the whistleblower for doing that, because I would probably argue that these reviews and reforms or internal audits would not be taking place only for this sort of revelation from the internal workings of the Education Authority in relation to special educational needs of children. And I think just to comment on that, to say there is no doubt that there, that there was certainly a prompt on the basis of the allegations that were made because they were extremely serious allegations and as an organisation we could not or would not ignore them, so there is no doubt about that. However, I would say again that since I came into post, I have met directly with parents, I have met with school principals, I have met with others and I have received the same feedback that you are describing and so therefore this has been an important and serious area for me as a Chief Executive to examine. And I appreciate that and I have no doubt that you are taking it as seriously as we are and uh, are shocked considering you're new to the role uh, about some of the findings and uh, uh, events that have taken place prior to your appointment. And I appreciate that from conversation that I've had with principals since you've come into the role that, that you are taking it very seriously. So I would put that firmly on the record to you, Chief Executive. Uh, Eager to move us on. And, and just as, as a final up, point, yeah. I think that it is very important that, yes, I welcome the apology on behalf of the Education Authority Sarah, which you have uh, put on record. Uh, I know that parents have been very stressed by the delays uh, in waiting for their children to be statemented properly and also frustrated by the revelations that have come since. I think it's important going forward that the Education Authority step up and say that they admit there was major failings, not shortcomings. To me, that's insulting. There was major failings. Children were let down. We have learned from those lessons and we're going to put it right. I think that's a key starting point for the Education Authority for to build trust and confidence in the organisation again. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks, Daniel. Morris Bradley. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, it's worrying that children may be waiting almost two years without a statutory assessment. My own constituency in East London Derry is 68 currently waiting assessment. Um, that's unacceptable. And that these children could be denied proper education based on their special needs for that length of time. It's an abject failure, I think, 
on behalf of the authority, which I may add has no reflection on you. Uh, you've only taken up post. Uh, however, the internal audit has identified staff failings uh, to abide by management processes. Have uh, the e uh, EA taken measures to remedy any of these failings uh, and that have been identified? And I know you've identified that you've reduced the backlog by 36 per cent. So how quickly can that backlog be brought under control, brought up to date, and uh, what are the resource implications? What's the cost going to be to do that? Because I would imagine you're going to have to bring in extra staff to do that. You know? Okay, so um, just to say that the, the audit was designed um, from the outset to identify the, the nature of and the scale of the issues that we had been receiving feedback on. And that was the nature and purpose of the audit, and that's what we're here today um, to describe to you. Um, the piece of work that we are still reaching a conclusion on is the work that Cynthia's team is developing around how long will it take us to do this, what resource will we need to clear the backlog, and more importantly, what resource will we need to ensure that we do not find ourselves back in this position again. So again, I I'm happy to bring that forward to the committee when that work um, is completed, but I did think it was important not to wait for that piece of work to be completed to come forward today in terms of the findings of the audit around the scale of the issues and the nature and extent of them. Uh, just one other point. Uh, you've identified the need for a culture change. How quickly can that culture change be initiated? I think one of the uh, a, a culture change requires you to bring the people along with you, and I think one of the positives that we do have is that going out into the offices, the staff welcome change, um, they welcome improvements. Um, they have been positive in the last number of weeks that we have been working through with them, and I believe that a culture change from about can about more quickly when you have that. But clearly, the nature of a culture change will take. Um, time also, and we w we will have to put time and effort into that. But I am uh, I'm heartened by the fact that we find a staff who are ready uh, to um, work with us on the improvements, and an improvement team that are very committed to making sure that happens. Sure, I, that's an, uh, a vital point that you've raised. Uh, uh, if you bring, if you're initiating change in any organisation, if you can bring the staff with you, mm -hmm. you're on the one side. But I would agree with Daniel uh, that it may be prudent to look at a full independent review of the entire education authority. Again, bear in reflection on, on yourselves being present here. Something I feel may happen. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Morris, can, uh, can I build on that as well in, in terms of the, the staff welcoming change? Are you concerned? Do you have any ideas why the person that brought key information to light to um, contribute towards the urgency of the audit, for whatever reason, didn't bring that information via internal proceedings in the Education Authority? Um, well, they, they had, as I understand it, left the organisation at that stage, but yes, the statement I made at that time was to ask um, anyone. Um, who had those concerns, or the person themselves, to, to, to come to come forward, or, um, either an, either anonymously or through our whistleblowing process or otherwise? But um, unfortunately, that didn't happen. And I, I presume that's a, a call you would reiterate to any member of staff within the Education Authority regards any issue now at this it stage. It is absolutely yeah. yes. Okay, uh, William Humphrey. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, ladies, for your presentation. So in your presentation, you say there were significant shortcomings um, and it was taking far too long for the process to be completed. You did mention over 1,000. I mean, Donna, you mentioned 1,000 children. What is the actual figure? It was 1,070. Right. So the, um, what, what makes me very concerned about all of this is 1,070 children, but if I think you said 22,000 children. Well, there the system at a given time? There are 22,000 children with statements. Yeah. So uh, is that 1,070 out of 22,000? No, that, that was 1,070 out of the total number of statements that we are currently processing. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. some, some of those applications will be from children in mainstream education without... Yes, but I'm trying to establish the, the actual figures here. 
in terms of percentages? I, I can help with you. Yeah. At the time, there were 2,268 children in open cases and 1,070 were beyond the 26. Out of how many overall? 2,268 open cases at yes. that particular but it, but What I'm asking is, is this out of the 22,000? No, there are 22,000 children in Northern Ireland that currently have a statement. Mm. Um, and on average, it is, since it has quoted the figures, that they, those are the current live statements that we have at the so, minute, so in terms of new referrals mm. and then children actually going through the process. So, so when you hear terms like change of culture, ladies, I have to say it does give me great cause for concern. Um, what exactly does that mean? What was the culture that allowed this to happen? I suppose I, I, there's a number of the findings that, that point to that. Um, uh, to summarise, there wasn't that proactive management of cases. So I talked about um, valid exceptions, and whilst valid exceptions are absolutely legal, uh, and they are in the legislation, it tended to be once a child had a valid exception. So a valid exception could be there was a delay in receiving health advice, and, and we all understand that there are some delays, you know, in terms of maybe getting appointments with... Uh, consultant paediatricians, whatever. So those are valid exceptions. What we found as a team was, however, that um, the proactive management of that case maybe wasn't as it should have been then. Once the, maybe the information did come back or there was no longer a reason for the valid exception, the case wasn't proactively managed. It was more reactively. So then whenever maybe a parent rang in or somebody alluded to a delay, then the case was looked at. So we didn't find a system that was proactively so managed. the term culture, that in, indicates to me that it's systemic, that it's widespread across an organisation, uh, and yet that's not what you're saying in terms of the presentation here. You're saying there, there obviously was good pockets of work being done around this. Can I, can I ask then, in terms of the, the um, EA board, we often have, obviously haven't seen sight of this, this, this full report, have they? No. Why is that? Because for the same reason that, that the committee haven't seen it, there are internal processes that need to reach a conclusion before the EA board would be in a position to see the full report. Okay. Does the EA have an audit committee? It does, yes. What were they doing throughout these uh, last number of years when this culture was prevailing? The um, audit committee have been briefed on the findings of the report um, and the chair of the audit committee has um, <coughs> Uh, has a, a, an oversight role now in terms of the improvements and ensuring that those improvements are put in place. And surely, surely the audit committee and the chair of the audit committee had that role prior to this report. What was it doing? The audit, what was the audit committee doing? And why were they not asked to do this report? Why was Donna brought in to do it? Well, Donna was brought. Well, Donna was in the organisation, and she was assigned to do the report on the basis of the skill set that she has, along with the team, because they were very particular um, pieces of work that we wanted to uh, understand um, and to test. So, again, the, the nature of the audit was to absolutely identify what were the, what was the scale and the nature of the areas and issues of concern. Um, on the basis of, of feedback that had been received. So mm. once we had the audit and we were able to very clearly identify those issues, that was taken to the um, audit committee and right. briefed. So you mentioned, Donna, when, uh, about when you give your evidence, you talked about your audit team. Mm -hmm. Your audit team isn't the audit... No, it was a team that, was, uh, that I put together to carry out the audit uh, practice. Uh, so it's anybody not the from the audit committee on it? No, nobody from our audit team. And not a bit odd? No, there weren't. No, it, this was a, a commit, uh, an audit that was commissioned by me as chief executive, um, in terms of response to feedback okay. received and and some of the the allegations that were made. So it was very much an executive team. Um, it was very much an executive team commissioned report by me, rather so, than a, a board commission. Has what's been described as a transformation committee been established in the EA? Yes. What is the transformation committee? Um, so, transformation uh, committee has been, or transformation team have been in place in the education authority since um, October, uh, September, October, um, eighteen. And we, as a team, are looking at designing services going forward for uh, young people. We have uh, myself and one other, uh, two other principals now, um, on the transformation team to provide that practitioner focus. 
So what we've been looking at are the areas that um, we can try to improve services uh, going forward, and we've been liaising and working very closely with the Department of Education and their transformation programme. So you, you lead the team, Cynthia? Yes, I've been since coming in. I've been and is, uh, taking it, is it just you and two other principals, or is it wider than that? Myself and two other principals, and we have a, a, pro, a program uh, lead on all. And you're answerable directly to the chief executive, are you? Um, to the chief executive, yes. Um, can I just ask, in, in terms, because in terms of the young people out there, the, the absolute trauma that uh, the 1,070 children and their families, in particular, have been going through, and you know that. So in the summer, I was part of a DUP delegation of MPs and MLAs who met you to read a lot of these concerns. Yeah. Um, they have obviously been going through a dreadful time. Uh, some of them, uh, shockingly, for over two years. Um, can I ask, in terms of the, the culture you talked about, what is the morale like in the organisation at this time? Well, I think, as Donna has described, we have teams of people who are working very hard in very difficult um, circumstances. Um, they are doing their best and they are doing a good job, but they do not want to deliver a poor service, um, and it is not their intention, I think, as someone said earlier, to come to work every day to deliver a poor service. So I have no doubt that they have been impacted on by the findings of this audit, but I think, as Cynthia has also described, I think that is that is a team of people who really want to see change and improvement and who really want to um, deliver um, that child-centred service that we described. In, to, to I welcome, as colleagues have welcomed, the uh, issue uh, being investigated. Uh, I welcome the fact that we have findings, however dreadful they are, in terms of the system, systemic feelings of the organisation. But I do think in terms of confidence for me as a public representative, for confidence in terms of school governors, as of which I'm one, uh, school principals, staff, parents, and for the, for the very best outcome for our young people. I think an internal uh, investigation report like this is, is one thing. For me, full independent inquiry or investigation is required to this to give confidence around these issues. Thank you. Thanks, William. Officials, um, the Minister for Education, Permanent Secretary for Education, are obviously have parent body responsibility for the Education Authority. To what extent have they been briefed on the audit impact report? The Permanent Secretary has been briefed on the, um, on the um, audit impact report, and, and I understand that the Permanent Secretary has briefed the Minister. The f have they... Uh, been briefed or access to the full report? The Permanent Secretary has seen the full report. The full report. Okay. And what has the Minister or the Permanent Secretary's response to the full report been? Um, at this point, the uh, Permanent Secretary and, and the Department um, wish to understand the improvements that we're planning to make, um, wish to understand the um, timescale around those improvements, much like the Committee, um, and that is something that we have committed to bringing forward to them. Okay. Um, in terms of valid exceptions, and if anybody else is going to ask about this, feel free to take it off me. Okay. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that for Robbie then. I'd be keen, I'd be keen that we draw out what the eight valid exceptions are, um, and which, to what extent, each individual exception played a key role in the delays. Was there one particular exception, ex etc.? Um, uh, but I, I'll, I'll not uh, follow that up now. I'll leave that for a member to come in on. Um, Catherine Kelly. Um, I think that today will be an extremely frustrating day for a lot of families. Um, I think that the most vulnerable in our society and the most vulnerable children in our society has left behind, have been left behind by the very organisation that is there to support them and to support them in education. Um, every week, I'm sure all our members are the same, there's at least one family in my office desperate for support for their children within school um, and constantly firefighting um, and us alongside them. Um, they, so despite the obvious consequences for the children and families, 
when a statement is delayed, are there any other practical consequences for the Education Authority when statutory timeframes are exceeded? Um, and given the fact that staff worked with the view that statutory timeframes were unachievable, what does this mean for plans to reduce the statement and timeframe? Okay, well, I think first of all, in response to that, I would say that, um, as I said, the, the audit was designed really to allow me as the chief executive and us as an organisation to understand the full nature and scale of the issues based on the very feedback that you're describing. Um, and that's absolutely what we want to do moving forward. I am determined that we will move away from the situation that you described with constant firefighting, with constant lobbying, with constant representation um, to enable children to move through what is a statutory assessment process. So I am absolutely determined that we will move away from that. And that is part of what the audit was designed to test um, to do, um, because I think you're absolutely right. I think this, as I said at the outset, it, it would be easy to see this as an administrative process. It is not an administrative process. It is a process that allows children and their families to access the right and appropriate support services for children. And we're absolutely determined that that's what it will become. Um, Chair, just one more. Um, on There's obvious issues with um, AT, AT assessment systems, which are cited in the report. Um, can you explain how the use of AT systems will be streamlined and made more effective going forward? Yep. Um, we currently have a, a legacy system called Capital One, um, and uh, we know that that needs to be significantly modernised. So one of the recommendations in the report is to review the functionality of the Capital One system, but also to appoint a, a system manager. So we need expertise around some of these IT systems um, to be able to, uh, to adequately manage them. Um, one of the other things um, Sarah has alluded to, I mean, the, system, the process is highly administrative and highly manual at the minute. So we, we work in paper, we post and, and whatever. We are doing a piece of work around digitisation of some of those manual processes, and there's quite a considerable part of the work stream is looking at that. So how can we digitise some of these processes, which mean that they are much faster and much more effective? So that is a key component. Um, and one of the members of the team, and, and that's one of the reasons that he was on the team, is he is our lead for digital transformation. So we are leading that piece of work around where we can use um, IT and digitisation to improve some of the manual processes around this to make it more quicker and effective. Okay. Okay, Justin McNulty. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Sarah Donna and Cynthia, for coming before the committee. And I appreciate it's very difficult circumstances, and I appreciate. Uh, I think we can all stand to your determination to put things right. So, I'd like to put my record my appreciation for that. That said, there's an overwhelming feeling of sadness, a weight of almost despair in this room that we can all sense because young people who are most vulnerable in our society have been failed, and that is. That is appalling. That is really, really tragic. Um, in terms of the education authorities, I'm going to talk about the culture change, which has been mentioned by a number of members already. Culture is, a, is an abstract or airy, furry concept, but ultimately cult culture is about the way things are done around here. DEA's mission is to provide high-quality education for every child. DEA's values our openness, respect, reflection, responsibility, excellence, and equality. To what extent has the Education Authority lived up to its mission and values? Justin, to say from the outset, one of the key pieces of the terms of reference of, of the um, audit of practice that was undertaken was to ensure that it was hinged or anchored off the EA values and that we could test those processes against our EA values. Mm. Say more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a team, I mean, we're very committed to those values and those were those are the values that were central to, so about excellence. So when we were looking at systems and processes, we weren't saying that they, they were okay. We were looking at measuring them against the best and, and an excellent process. What should an excellent process look like? Um, Responsibility was a key value in terms of who is responsible for this and the operations of this on a day-to-day -day basis, and is that something that's in place or not in place? 
um, respect, obviously respect for children and their parents and respect for staff as well. So again, that was a key value. So all of those values were interwoven in terms of the terms of uh, reference. They're also interwoven in the, in the improvement plan as well. And it is about excellent services. We're not trying to fix this. We are trying to improve this okay. so that no child waits longer than they should uh, or is necessary to do so. So those values and open and transparency. And as a team, as an audit team, um, we worked very closely with the staff on the ground. We were very open with the staff in terms of what we found. Um, and we also were very much that um, we would support them and we would help them in terms of the improvements. And that's the work that Cynthia is leading. Well, I would, I would uh, only anticipate that you would seek to live up to those values. Mm -hmm. My question was, to what extent has the Education Authority lived by those values? Um, from what we're hearing today, you may as well throw in those values in the bin, because they meant nothing. They were, they were red, letter, words on the wall, and that was it. And that's, that's appalling, because that's because children have been failed because of that. In terms of the culture change that's been discussed already, culture change is not an easy um, undertaking in any circumstances and does the education authority have that ability within the organization to drive that culture change at yourselves or does there need to be an outside consultant brought in to make sure that that culture change is, change is driven from the top and driven from every level within the organization because that's essential in terms of making making the changes that need to happen here to help the children who need help the most and i think that that cultural change can only be driven from within because it has to be driven and owned by our mm -hmm. own teams and our own staff as cynthia um, <coughs> has described and i do believe that the work that cynthia and the team are doing will will assist us but what i would also say is whatever we will need to do or make an assessment of as an organization in order to do this we will do that my, my, my advice again is that i, I believe that outside consultation would be uh, helpful in this regard in terms of guiding that cultural change in terms of the know-how to be able to do that. In terms of children's records, um, you've mentioned the Capital One system. Can you describe the Capital One system for me, please? In what way? Sorry, it's what, how is what, that, what how, it is. So, yeah. is that, so every child is on that Capital One system and every person within the Education Authority has access to that system to yeah. each children? How, what are the, so, yeah, it is our main management told. information system in terms of children within the Education Authority and there are a number of what we call modules within the system and there's one particularly around special education. So all children that um, are in, uh, that receive special education will be on that system and contain all of their details and who their workers are and whatever. There's, there's a particular module that deals with the statement and process. So as an audit team, we viewed that system, we viewed how it was being used in the offices. Um, as part of the action plan, the transformation action plan that had been commenced, there were a number of procedures um, put in place in terms of making sure that information was accurate going on to the system. Um, <coughs> so it, it previously had been five legacy systems, as you would understand. We had five education and, li uh, education and library boards, so there were five, if you like, Capital One systems. There is now one EA, so all of that information is in one area. There is limited access, of course there is, in terms of information, governance and security, so only staff that work in those areas and need access to that system would have access to that system. There are shortfalls in the current system in terms of it is quite an old system um, and the reporting capabilities are maybe not what we would, what we would need. But we have, as I say, in terms of the improvement plan, that is one of the actions because it is a central repository of information and it's also a central part of driving and proactive management because that is where we will get our management information that we want the teams to be looking at and that is what we're doing now. We are using the system to get us more robust management information to drive improvements and to monitor uh, how those improvements are impacting. Okay, that, that system is crucial then in terms of assessing your operations yep. assessing, to be able to have quick access to data and if you're not assessing you're guessing yeah, so absolutely and hence one of the recommendations is particular around that area and the need for a, a system manager in that area and that is part of the improvement process going forward can you give me some guidance in terms of principals who feel they're not getting definitive guidance in terms of emergency cases um, and what actions to adopt for those emergency cases principal feel completely on their own out on their own in terms of emergency cases of children needing provision, special needs, special, special education. Day provision, a short term provision, an emergency provision. Um, I mean, in terms of the actual stage that a child reaches provision, uh, i.e., from the, the statement of intent through to provision, 
we have a work stream that will be focused particularly on that particular area. Um, as Donna mentioned earlier, there have been um, instances where, um, for example, transport has been something that the principals have brought up in the past, where class assistance, um, emergency class assistance have been an issue. And what the report, the audit report did find was that some of our processes were um, letting us down because there wasn't good partnership working. Um, so I suppose from my point of view in the um, improvements going forward, I can say to principals that we will be doing everything that we can possible to make that a better uh, situation. And as I said to one of the members earlier, uh, communication is a particular aspect of the processes that we have found that needs improvement and we will be working going forward to try to uh, improve that. I understand as a principal myself that um, there are absolute frustrations around this process and therefore it, I absolutely will be intending to try to make this better for principals. And it is a lonely position and you do need that support and we will do everything we can in future to try to make that happen. Okay, well you mentioned communication there, Cynthia, and I know another principal raised me the issue of communication whereby a lot of it through, you know, you're trying to introduce new initiatives and a lot of communication with principals is via email only and they feel they're yes. not given um, appropriate air time to be able to, to table their real concerns and, that, and they don't feel that email is the appropriate um, medium by which to do that. Um, tell me, what advice would you give to a principal who has five children who require special educational psychology need and screening and have been allocated time for only three? Um, so, um, Justin, I actually met with a group of school principals on Friday afternoon of last week around this very issue. Um, uh, they were representing their, their wider group and I think while this report and this audit focused on the statutory assessment process, I think what it certainly highlighted to us was that the statutory assessment process is impacted on by other services and one of the key things that has, has come out of that that we really will need to pay attention to now and focus on is the allocation of educational psychology services and how, how that currently happens and how that might happen moving forward. Yeah, okay, yeah. Just to supplement that very briefly, the management responsibilities for the statementing process, were they the same managerial responsibilities for the allocation of educational psychology? No, they're separate. No? Okay. Sorry, Justin, go ahead there. Okay, thanks, Sir. Sure. Um, do you feel it's a child centred approach or child friendly process if it's totally resource driven? In terms of the statutory assessment process, I think um, we, we would all accept that, as I said earlier, no, it's easy, it's easy to see this as an administrative process, but it's not. It ought to be a child-centred process, and that's certainly where we want to bring this service to. And you're focused on determined about bringing Absolutely that. determined to do that. Um, given, given the shocking and uh, appalling revelations we've all uh, been exposed as a, as a consequence <coughs> of this audit, what, are, what actions have or are being taken to hold those responsible for these feelings to account? Well, they are serious findings, as I said before, and I do take them very seriously and I do take the impact that they have on children and families very seriously. They are not findings in their, in their own right, they are findings that indicate to us. So, um, at the end of the day, where there are shortfalls in the organisation as the chief executive I am responsible for that but I am also responsible for taking forward the improvements and for driving the changes that we need to happen in terms of any internal processes within the authority they need to be allowed to conclude. Can I supplement it? Do you want to supplement it first Justin? You're okay Daniel. So I understand that as head of the organisation Sarah the book stops with you. It does yes. But Will anyone be held accountable for these feelings directly? There are internal EA processes, Daniel, that need to be allowed to conclude. Yes, but I'm asking, I'm not asking you for detail, I'm asking will there be people held accountable for the feelings within that particular area? So yes or no, just simply. I'm not in a position to answer that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Justin, do you want to come back in at all? No. Thank you very um, much. In, in terms of Justin's question, officials, um, I think it's fairly clear that the Education Authority, in respect to the statement being 
and support of children with special educational needs has failed its mission to provide high quality education for all. Um, you mentioned a, a, a Capita One system manager to try to ensure that that mission is improved. Has that system manager been appointed? No, we're currently recruiting that. Yes. What is the time scale for appointment? These are quite um, skilled people, so we're actually with our job description finalised, and we're, we're we're going to advertise that post eminently. But we need to get the right person, um, Chris, as well. So we need the right skill set. Okay, uh, Karen Mullen, Deputy Chair. Thank you. Thank you for for coming in, and as outlined by the chair and uh, all our members, the findings are stark and confirm for myself, um, families, principals, and stakeholders the experience that we've had with uh, the Children and Young People's Services. Sarah, you've been up front in terms of the shortcomings and um, I suppose I'm welcome at that it's a priority for yourself um, and you're going to be proactive on it. And uh, it's good to see Cynthia as well in the role because it's important that somebody who was involved in front line knowing the day-to-day -day issues is in there. Um, I suppose looking at the, the, the report, um, Twice last year, um, myself and my party colleagues, all our members, had asked uh, the Education Authority to carry out reviews or reports, first being a year ago last March, when the first cases of parents went to the media, and our board members at that stage asked for a review in March. Um, there was some work initiated and started over that, but when we seen then in September, the next case coming along, or cases, um, uh, like all our members, our party met with yourself, Sarah, and the chief uh, and the chair of the board, um, and we asked for an independent uh, review or audit to be carried out, or even independent oversight. According to the executive summary, Sarah, you, it says that you commissioned an, an independent internal audit, and I find that that's about a contradiction within itself. Um, and just, I suppose, you know, as the EA content with the, comp no, the, the content um, and the comprehensiveness of the audit, given the fact that it's been carried out with, by EA staff, and that is in no way a criticism, a criticism of Donna and her team, but I just think for the sake of public confidence and what we've heard here today, all our members, that the audit um, should have been carried out um, by people external to the Education Authority, um, and, it's, and it, it is something I think needs to be looked at for going going forward. If you look at key, the key finding uh, number two is particularly stark. It is quite clear that some staff <coughs> made a mockery of the statement and process and their obligations to children and families. Um, and this is evident by the misuse of valid exceptions. I've been in this role for two and a half years. And I have reported this to yourself and the previous chief executive and, and what we have been experiencing and the chair of the board and our board members. Because when I've been engaging with stakeholders um, like the Children's Commissioner and the Children's Law Centre, they have all raised all the, the, same, all the findings that we have found here today. They have continuously raised them. They have had the statistics and evidence there for a very long time for the cases that they have been working with families, um, and it was it was very very frustrating for myself um, and all our um, our board members and all our members of our party that that didn't seem to be, be acted on. And I know, Sarah, you're new in the role, and it's going to be acted on now. We shouldn't have we shouldn't have had a wit the a number of cases went to the media last year to do it, and I believe that this needs to be um, uh, carried out um, uh, extensively and widely. Um, in the report, you see the systems uh, highly. Systems are highly manual. Um, uh, I find that, in this day and age, you know, uh, a bit stark. And staff worked in, in uh, the belief that they didn't have to uh, work the time frames, so time scales was unachievable. We heard here today. I would expect, I suppose, in an, organis an organisation like the Education Authority, that there would be disciplinary procedures as, as uh, alongside line management, all along, not just as, as crisis points. So management de deficiencies are quite are cited quite frequently in this document, and it is clear that um, many individuals are doing great work, 
but um, going by the audit, it is also clear that, though, that some impositions of management um, have let some of the most vulnerable children down. So I suppose I wanted to ask this the education authority saying that the management is ultimately responsible for the backlog and the stipends in this in the system. I think, Karen, if, uh, there are a number of recommendations in the report, um, and there are a number of key systemic issues that are that are highlighted, um, and we have a recommendation around each of those. So we are working our way th um, through, as Cynthia has described, each of those recommendations. So I think what I would say to you is there there are a range of issues that have been identified as to how we find ourselves in this position. I think it's back to your, your, your comments on the feedback that, that you have received are, are as well the comments and the feedback that I have received since I came into post and that's part of what the audit was designed to do which was around um, making sure we I fully understood what the nature and the scale of the issues were and, and I have confidence um, in the report that was um, completed I think it was a detailed um, piece of work. I think it was a thorough piece of work. It was carried out comprehensively over a period of time. Um, I think, as I've said earlier, it, it leads us to ask more questions and it leads us to ask more questions around other service areas that are linked to the statutory assessment process. But I believe and have confidence in the report in its own right. And just you mentioned the recommendations and just following up on what the point that Robin had made. Um, uh, I think they need to be firmed up. I think we need stringent line management, structure and accountability. That's coming out from all of this. Um, and, and, and we need time frames around all of those because this has been going on a very long time. As I say, it's the first thing came through my door when I came in. And I have said this to you in the past, Sarah, the, the staff member that I have has went on training, two sets of training with the Children Law Centre for us to be able to deal with the amount of cases that's coming through the door. And we weren't getting when we contacted yourselves the advice and support that we needed um, and that was an approach that, that, that I had had taken um, so I suppose we can't touch on any HR uh, anything around HR and I wouldn't want to do but broadly speaking you know can you say give us any indication of what were the governance and, and assurance issues that ultimately led to the temporary allocation of some areas of responsibility. No. Um, and just a point to come as well, looking at it, we need a separate review of educational psychologists. Um, uh, we're constantly you know, um, meeting people and chatting to them, and they're telling us they didn't go under that role to become form followers. You know, that's not what they're trained for. So I think there's a separate review and touching on what, jo what Justin said, and it's a very, very valid point, the allocation of hours, um, skills, the pressure that they're under in terms of that, the review needs to be done. It needs to be acted on immediately and those resources need to come down the line. Uh, in the past, I had been, been constantly been told by principals around their allocation of hours, but when I discussed it with um, officials in the Education Authority, you were led to believe that there wasn't really allocation of hours, if, uh, that it was on based on need, but um, that is certainly not the case and uh, it, it needs to be acted on. Who is the director responsible for the management of the allocation of educational psychology hours? Director of Children and Young People's Services. Okay, but I had asked previously if the managerial responsibility for Oh, sorry, I had, I had um, answered the previous question at assistant director okay. level, sorry. Okay, so the managerial responsibility for the statementing process and special schools <coughs> um, and education, the allocation of educational psychology hours previously um, were allocated to the director of Children and Young People Services. They all were, all of those... Um, matters were under the management of the uh, Children and Young People Services Directorate. Okay, that, that's helpful clarification. Um, I th uh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, before I bring Robbie in, can I just uh, say clarification on a couple of points quickly as well. That of the 2,268 open cases, um, 1,070 of which were beyond the 26 weeks, which is almost 50%, I believe, um, were they... Is the start was the start date on those um, the actual date of referral or the or a, a 
false start date stamp. So I mean, could they actually could could those cases be long be ha longer than than what you've actually assessed them to be? We we didn't look at all two thousand cases. We weren't able to do that, so um, I couldn't say that. Um, so given that you did identify the an accurate recording of referral dates for assessments, it is possible that some of those cases are even longer than what you have are waiting even longer than what you've established. There is a yeah. possibility, yes. Okay, and do you have a t you have, however, reduced? The, the number of cases in breach of that statutory deadline to 676. Mm -hmm. What is there a time scale for reducing that to zero? Um, as I said, Chris, I think we need to come back to the committee with that. Our priority today was to share okay. the findings and recommendations of the um, audit of practice. They are as they are. Cynthia's team is working on our improvement metrics, our timeline around those, and we will absolutely. Um, share those with you and you will have that and also the resource required but you'll understand that that in itself will take um, some time to do what we wanted to do was come here and share the findings with you in advance of that okay thank you robbie butler thank you chair um, Donna, Sarah, and Cynthia. i'm going to look at your names again tried to memorize them there, but i couldn't so thank you uh, for what you've done so far i just want to thank the members for for the, the questions that put you i found them very useful and the information that's been provided today um, has been good, and it's just a pity we didn't have it uh, a number of weeks ago. Um, and, and I'm listening to things so far, and, and, and if it sounds like I'm asking the same question, I'm genuinely not. There's a, there's another level to this, but I've had to write this down because there's quite a lot to it. But it looks to me that there was a, certainly a chronic cultural failure with regard to supporting and resourcing some of the most uh, valued and vulnerable pupils in our schools. Okay, I think that's accepted. But the issues which jumped out at me from the pages and from some of your own uh, reports was the attitude, attitudinal dismissal of statutory frameworks, um, the potential abuse or ignorance of this, the seven valid exemptions, which hopefully we'll, we'll hear a wee bit more about, and inexplicably within a single umbrella organisation that staff were operating on multiple databases and platforms. And I know we've talked about the capital system, but that's not databases. Databases are, are, are simple Microsoft issues. Mm -hmm. So this, that's nothing to do with a, a system. Mm -hmm. I think that's incredible within one umbrella organisation to me. Um, so therefore, when you look at those three things out of the, 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 the wider range of, of uh, failures, it's easy to see why there was a, such a magnitude of failure. Um, we've talked about the 85% who did not complete in the, in the time frame. So my first question would be, um, how on earth did it take a whistleblowing allegation uh, to bring this to where we are now? And why was it not recognised? Uh, we talked about the audit committee, uh, the board, um, and perhaps where management is. How was it not picked up as a red flag before someone was uh, prepared to, to whistleblow? Well, as I said, there was certainly feedback, um, Robbie. I mean, as I say, I met with parents directly myself, um, Karen has described some of the feedback that she has provided. School principals have provided feedback in this area, so I think it was more a trigger at that point um, in order to be able to absolutely understand the, the exact nature and the exact extent. So general feedback that um, things needed to be improved, but what I, what I wanted from the audit was an absolute clarity around the nature and the extent um, of the issues so that we could have a very targeted improvement um, plan there. As Donna said, there was, there was one in place and one that was developed, and yes, it was progressing, but what became clear to me was that it wasn't having the desired impact or outcome that it ought to have, and that was part of what we wanted the audit to have a look at as well. Were the improvements taking place on the ground? Were they having the impact on the ground? And the audit concluded that no, they were not. And I appreciate that, sir, and I think we focused on today and the good work and good practices been going on that you've initiated, and I get that. What I don't understand is why it was at 1,070. Um, this is that we're sitting outside the statutory timeline and that either on a monthly or a quarterly basis that the responsible person wasn't highlighting that either to yourself or to the board as a major concern. I don't understand. And my fear is this, that whilst we might be able to fix this and come up with something, what is the actual framework and measurement of preventing that happening again? What does that look like on a quarterly basis that some responsible person is able to say to you, this is our target, we have met, or we're not meeting our target and I need more resources. So, so rather than yeah. the piece of work that's been done, what does that assurance look like? So that's um, our performance management mm -hmm. framework as an organisation is currently under development and that will be about all of our routine reporting and what will come through to the executive team and onward to board. And, and Donna is actually um, leading on the 
the development of that, and that's what are our routine indicators. I feel very strongly, and I think I said that to you at, I said at the start, it won't be enough for us to simply describe to you how we're making improvements. We are absolutely going to have to demonstrate to you how we're making those improvements, and particularly if those improvements are going to take place over time so that you can see sustained progress, so that I can see sustained progress. So that is, uh, that is absolutely fundamental, and I, and I fully um, accept, accept your point on that, and that's what I've committed to bringing back to committee when we have those metrics fully developed because it will not be enough in order to restore confidence for us to say we are making improvements we are going to have to fully and absolutely demonstrate those improvements and, and i accept that um, um just uh, just uh, just to finish this one out i've got two more questions if you wouldn't yeah, mind because I, you did I ask her to come yeah, back to the no, seven, no, that's fine. yeah i would like to i'd like, seven I'd like to supplement you on this point as well so okay, go sorry. ahead with yours and then i can't go ahead yeah okay, go ahead so in terms of the the, the valid exceptions it, it, what wait then, say on that, hold on, we're valid exceptions then, okay, right? Okay. So, in terms of non-compliance, I mean, are we, are we saying that people were not providing um, the relevant processes with information, with real information in relation to how bad this was? Nice. That doesn't seem to have been covered in the findings here. Or, so, I mean, I think these are questions with regards to why systemic failure wasn't identified and audited by the EA board are, are probably for the EA board to answer what the EA board's doing to establish why there was a failure to identify this is a question for the board as well but in your audit have you picked up any evidence of anything akin to a cover up or a lack of proactive provision of up to date and accurate information with regards to these processes because that that's going to prevent the EA board from doing its job. Mm -hmm. I suppose that, that is one of the findings that, that we do address. We talk about you know routine standardised management information reports were, were not systematically or routinely produced or used for senior management. So that is that is that was a, a gap. Uh, in the previous process, as Sarah said, we're about to implement a performance management framework that we will be providing, and I mean we in terms of my team and the independence from my team, will be producing and pulling off our big systems uh, management information, and then we will be reporting that through to directors and onward to the chief executive and on to boards, so there will be much more visibility around what, what, what this did, performance management. What did, the, what did the internal audit processes look like? Mm -hmm. Like is, what what was the internal auditing of directorates? What 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 is the existing EA board process of auditing each directorate and its performance? There is a well, I think internal audit. Either that broke down or the information provided to it broke down. Which one was it? I think there is a distinction between the internal audit process itself versus what would be routine performance management information. Um, and as Donna says, moving forward, where we want to get to be is that this information is routinely provided, and not only is it routinely provided, but it's routinely provided and publicly available. Um, and that that is that is our goal moving forward. So you won't have to ask me where we are. You will be able to see that at any given time. And that I, I, I appreciate that, and that is welcome. But the the interest, the public interest here, is. What happened? That what what were the EA internal audit processes that did not pick this systemic failing up, and and was was it inadequate internal audit processes or was it inadequate provision of information to those audit processes? What can can you give us some in, insight into that? My sense would be that it was around the information that was provided. Um, rather than an internal audit process per se, because okay. actually if you're providing routine management information, as, Do as Donna has described, then you don't necessarily need okay. to undertake an internal audit because you're aware of and well, clear I, about the I, issues. I can't work out why it's in anyone's interest not to report difficulties dealing that is why with... We're, that is why we are here today. Chris? Okay. Um, and I mean, that that is concerning, though, because... Um, the inadequate provision of information in relation to this process may well extend to other mm -hmm. processes within a particular directorate that oh, does yeah. not deal with just this process. And a board will struggle to perform its functions 
if it is being kept in the dark Absolutely. about challenges within its organisation. One of the challenges. Um, so, okay. Um, Robbie, keen to bring in on valid exceptions as I well. Thank you for your indulgence. Yeah, okay, Thank just you. before I go off that, and the reason that I, I, I'm, I'm focused in on that one, the Chair, was uh, previously in, in another guise in the fire service that I, uh, as a manager, I had to report back, but I only reported back on the questions that were asked in terms of performance, in terms of output. I'm just keen to know in terms of what was being asked of those people to report, and maybe it was, as, as the Chair has rightly said, is it the report mechanism that's wrong? Because if it's not asking the right questions, it's not going to get the right information. And it seems to me that 1,070 <coughs> outside of that statutory framework should have been picked up on both counts, and that it should have been reported. The second, it should have been sought. The information should have been sought. Um, as an MLA, and I'm sure the, the rest of the panel members will probably have a little bit of the, the, our eyes open today in terms of when we're trying to reach into the EA for information for frustrated parents and <coughs> pupils who are trying to access the psychological assessment and those type of things. That very often, there, there were excuses like um, someone was off sick, someone was uh, off for maternity, or someone was on holiday. We know that the databases were an issue, so they probably weren't sure the information was, was, but there didn't seem to be any accountability for anybody for transferring cases, and, 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 and as opposed to it sat with someone's desk and it just seemed to sit there forever. Um, would, would that be a, a, an accurate analysis that, that, that case, cases were with individuals? And if that individual wasn't there, there was no responsibility or no um, uh, policy that, that said this is, this is how someone else has responsibility for that case or the overall caseload. I suppose I can only comment on the statutory statement and process, but yeah, I mean, we, did, we did find that there wasn't that proactive management, so therefore, you know, um, there was, and because there was no routine management information used, there was no kind of helicopter view mm -hmm. in terms of the team and... You know, if there was a case sitting for a long period of time and perhaps maybe somebody was off, you know, um, that wasn't proactively managed is what we found, yeah. I, I've just got one more question, and, and it's, it's, it's not off piece, but it actually is. Go ahead, just go ahead. Moment, Justin's piece, OK? You save yourself 30 seconds every time by just asking the <laughs> question, Robert. I'm just looking at you can tell me off. Um, <laughs> I, I never tell you off. Go ahead. Um, I, listen, I, I don't want to add the, the very serious uh, issues that you guys are dealing with, OK? But we must be clear that we're focusing on children um, Absolutely. Uh, who, who need some form of assessment process. But as, as Justin rightly alluded to, there are lots of children who can't even access um, the, the, the process. So my fear is that, and, and it's right that we focus on fixing the, the problem in the backlog, okay? But are we fixing something that actually needs fixed itself? in terms of the whole problem? Because, sir, you have, have said time and time again, this is pupil-centred, it's, it's individually focused and so on. Well, if that is the case, and our teachers are telling us that we have, they're frustrated because there are pupils going through years of education without the ability to access um, the educational psychologist or assessment for special education needs, and, and yourself, you'll, you'll know you've been frustrated many times and it's good to see you there. But, but, and whilst I want to see this fixed and this backlog addressed, can we have confidence that actually what we're going to get is a fundamental review and recommendations to improve the whole process. I think that really is what we're at yes, as a Robbie. branch. Yes, Robbie, absolutely. I think we have a responsibility right here and right now to those children who are currently in the statementing process, and that has been our immediate focus. But moving forward and the longer term plans are around looking at the entire end to end journey for children in this process because. Otherwise, you're quite right that there is no point in running something faster, for example, if it's not the right thing to run. And I am absolutely at one with you on that. Okay, thank you. And there, indeed, there is a, a wider departmental review of SEM provision that yes. has been ongoing for 10 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, maybe this is a timely point to ask a, a question. To, to what extent uh, did uh, inadequate resources contribute to this feeling? <laughs> It's difficult to comment, Chris, without the analysis, but um, I suppose what, what we certainly do know and what Cynthia has encountered um, already working with the teams is that we do believe that even in the short term, in terms of addressing this backlog, we will require more resources. Um, we also are clear already that we will require additional resources in order to put the support services in place, not just to run the statementing process. And that's the work that we're trying to do to quantify and to look at how, how much um, additional resource do we need. I would say internally as an organisation we will be prioritising those immediate staff resources um, and that will certainly be an issue for us to address. But uh, we, we're clear 
that we will require additional resource. Because in addition to extreme difficulty accessing statement, there is also significant reports, I presume, across MLAs of significant difficulty accessing the statemented support once yes. it is in place. Um, and indeed, obviously, you know, to build on um, Robbie's question, the, the statement in process it's st itself is scheduled to change from five stages to three stages. Um, will your operations be ready to respond to those changes, given what has been identified by the audit? It will depend on the implementation date, Chris, and it will also depend on the level of resource that comes with those changes. Okay. Um, in, term, in terms of the valid exceptions, okay, there's eight valid exceptions. Seven. Seven. seven, seven. seven. Yeah. They are further advice to be sought by the board to complete its assessment, which seems extremely wide-ranging. Parents wish to provide advice to the board more than six weeks after they were invited to do so. Advice from a school principal is, is delayed because of a school closure. Advice sought from a health and social service trust has not been provided within six weeks. Exceptional personal circumstances affect the child or the parent. The child or parent is away for at least four weeks during the 18-week period, mm -hmm. or an appointment for examination or test is not kept. They to what extent are those seven valid exemptions exceptions fit for purpose, and which ones of the, was is there any pattern as to which one or few of those exceptions were used to accept a, a statement being or an assessment being completed within twenty six weeks? In, in terms of the valid exceptions themselves, just to say that they are in the legislation, and we do expect when the legislation changes that they will change, um, and certainly that's part of the uh, conversations and discussions we've been having with DE in terms of their fit for purpose and timeliness today. Mm -hmm. Donna, in terms of the range of valid exceptions? Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, that is one of the recommendations as a team. You know, whilst they're in the legislation, we believe, uh, setting aside the practice, we believe actually they, they're, not, they're not helpful in terms of the statement and process because there's no upper limit. So you could legally apply a valid exception because there's a delay in receiving health advice. There's no upper limit in that. But the new legislation, there are upper limits that, you know, if the advice is not received within a period of time. So... I think that's one of, as a team, we felt that was one of the, the weaknesses in that. So I suppose it is important to say that they are legal um, to apply a valid exception and there are deficiencies in the valid exceptions themselves that have led to, to some of the issues. Um, an answer to probably your question about one, one of the major ones that we encountered is um, the valid exception around health advices. So that um, the audit team were given uh, information that highlighted that almost two-thirds of the valid exceptions that were applied were due to health advice not being provided. Um, and then about 24% was uh, other professionals, schools or parents within six weeks. So... Um, I, did, did we ask how many of the 1,070 cases that were beyond the 26th deadline had valid exceptions? I don't think you asked me that, no. Can I? <laughs> I don't have the exact figure, but what I would say is a considerable amount... I would say a high percentage had valid exceptions, yes. And, a, and two thirds of the valid exceptions were as a result of advice sought from a health and social service trust not being provided within six weeks? Yes, that was the, the valid exception that had been applied so to the case. Has it, has, uh, did the audit or has the EA explored what, what reasons? Yeah. Exist I mean, for a health and social service trust to not provide advice within six weeks? I suppose it's important to say that the team acknowledged that there are definite delays, you know, with regard to advices and specifically medical information being received. We also believe that um, once the valid exception had been applied, that proactive management, so we did have evidence where valid information had been received back from health, but actually the case hadn't been moved on because. Um, there wasn't that proactive once, management. Once that 26 week deadline was breached, it was breached and the deadlines weren't there anymore. But um, it, 
we have worked. Yeah. We have been doing work with yeah. with health, um, okay. Chris, and I think it goes back okay. to that the audit itself was designed to provide us with the nature and the extent of the issues. Um, and as I think sure. I said, it raises as many questions mm -hmm. for us. We have been doing work with health. We know yeah. the DE are working closely with health around the new um, regulations and the new uh, legislation yeah. so that we can actually be much more clear and specific around actually what health advice is required, why do we require it and, and how long ought that to take. We, this this a predecessor committee um, hosted an evidence session on similar or same matters at Stranmanus College, Clark, Indeed. and health staff presented and this issue was identified as an issue. I, I think it's incumbent on anyone with responsibility for these matters to further probe what is happening in that um, failure to for Health and Social Service Trust to provide information within six weeks. I, is, I is, it a, is it a reasonable deadline? I, th I was um, going to say, Chris, I, I think mean, that... It doesn't seem like the audit had scope to properly investigate that aspect of it. And, and we're talking about two thirds of valid exceptions, a high percentage um, of cases beyond 26 weeks being valid exceptions. So I, I think there's a real need to investigate what the Health and Service Trust rule is in relation to this process. I would agree with you, but I would also draw back to, to Robbie's point, which is actually, I think we need to look at the full process. Okay. And is that being done? It will be. By the Department and the Education Authority? Yes. Okay. Um, bring Daniel McCrossan back in. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, it, it's just around the 1070 figure. Um, given that some have waited up to two years to be statemented or reviewed, um, I'm just thinking about the overall rippling consequences of that on a clash of environment. Uh, the burden that that faces in terms of stress on the teacher, on the head principal, or and directly the other pupils or children in the classroom. And I think one of the biggest stressors in this for uh, the teachers and also the principals is how you manage that resource. The resource is non-existent. So if a, if a child in a classroom is distressed or in need of attention. That teacher diverts their immediate attention in the absence of a classroom assistant or support staff, which in many cases that's the reality, to that child. So in actual fact throughout this entire process, quite a number of children have suffered the consequences of this failure. Would that be an accurate I think, Daniel, that we go back to my, to my original point, which is it is easy to see this as an administrative process. It is not an administrative process. It is something that impacts greatly on children, and that is why it is, I take it so seriously, um, and that is it is because of it's the impact of this process on children. Cynthia, I don't know if you want to explain from a school perspective. Well, certainly from a school perspective, I would concur with you know what you're saying, obviously, on met need and on due delay will have an impact uh, in the classroom and for the child, for other children, um, for staff on front line that are, are dealing with that, and also for um, head teachers and pastoral care heads who are working with families um, through that. So I suppose I, I reiterate what I have said uh, you know, before. This is something we absolutely have to fix. It is unacceptable that there are these delays. I, I concur that there have been people failed within the system. And we will do our best moving forward to make sure that this is better. Yeah. And, and, and I suppose the funding of vital and necessary resources in terms of support staff and other elements is hugely important, particularly for the school and more directly for those children that are impacted. Uh, thank you for that answer. Just briefly, Chair, there's a number of other things. Um, how, long, how, long, how long do you think it's going to take to implement some of the recommendations or the changes that you are proposing here? What, what is the time frame to get these into place? Well, not so when I left the room. Well, we do, we do have the action plan, as Cynthia said. What we want to try and do now is to put very clear and robust um, 
improvement metrics around that action plan so that it's not just a series of actions, if you like, that we give our assessment on to you as to whether or not they've been concluded, but that we're actually measuring the impact of that and we can show and demonstrate that improvement. So that's what I've committed to bringing back to the committee so that we can give you a robust and accurate um, assessment of how long it will take and how much resource will be required to deliver it. And th thank you for that answer as well. Just briefly, Chair, uh, I, I keep I'm battling with myself throughout this entire session about the independence of or about the audit process generally. What 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 made you opt for an internal audit as opposed to an independent, fully independent audit? Well, as I said, at that point in time, Daniel I too had heard feedback um, around these areas, and what I wanted to do was to get an assessment of the extent um, and the nature of the issues in relation to that feedback. And I had a team of people who, within the organisation who could do that and who had full trust and confidence in to deliver that. So that's the approach that I took. It brings us this audit today, which tells us and, and outlines for us what it is. It is, it is findings and it is the, uh, the, the nature and the impact. But as I've said, it, it clearly has implications now um, wider and beyond this process, and we will have to attend to those. And I appreciate that. And just to follow on from the Chair's point, the, the Chair rightly expresses, as will other members around uh, this committee, uh, of concerns for other uh, directorates, um, areas of responsibility across EA. Uh, and if, if this is what has been exposed as a result of an internal audit, have you any concerns that there may be other substantial issues within other areas of EA that will need the same approach? I think that's certainly what our performance management framework is designed to do, which is to provide me with early alerts and routine information on all of the areas of EA business so that we can, where we need to, have a deeper and further look. And Sarah, just, just in relation to that, and, and, and again, given that you're only in the role a short time, do you not feel it would be much more beneficial to get a clearer picture, to have an entire independent review of EA so that we know exactly where, where the starting point is and what needs to be achieved as a result of it. Because if we're going to do this bit by bit approach and we get a report and we get a report, I think this is going to lead into considerable difficulty and time delays and also maybe further revelations in terms of what we've heard today in all areas. So I just, I'm just coming back to this view that a full independent review is going to be necessary for the Education Authority now after today. And I'm just wondering, from your own view, given that you're in the organisation now just under a year, would you share that view? Would you be open to that? I would be open to that. I, I wouldn't have a fixed view on it. I do have a view that we have attended an awful lot to structures and processes um, in education over a long period of time, and I believe we've done that to the detriment of services and service delivery. I would like our focus moving forward to be on services, service delivery, the service we provide to children and young people. And I do want us as an education authority to be able to instill and build confidence um, in the, the, the public and our wider stakeholders. And I think part of that has to be that we can show and demonstrate that we are an organisation that can hold ourselves to account and that we are an organisation that has robust governance arrangements that we can highlight and bring forward things like this ourselves rather than always relying on someone else to do that on our behalf. But that's my own. It's a, a mammoth right. task, and I yep. appreciate I, yep. uh, that, that you will too. take it seriously. And, and we are a very, we are a very large organisation, a very complex organisation. So it's balancing all of that up. Uh, and chair, just a final point: it's just um, of the of the many families affected, many children affected of their families, who many of them have have been pushed to tribunals to try and get provision for their children. Are you aware of those figures? Yeah, we, we have figures around that, and again, that is one of the areas that we've covered in the audit, and, and one of the areas that we talked about in one of the recommendations that I called the SAP panel, which is the statutory assessment panel. That's where they make decisions about whether to proceed with, with a statement, and the, the information that we have highlighted that there were a number of cases that were either conceded once they went to tribunal or were overturned, and that's an area, again, in terms of our findings and in terms of the recommendations we there needs to be work done around the decision-making process, around statements so that parents don't feel they need to go to tribunal. Um, and uh, obviously, there's an issue around our decision-making when we're conceding the high volume of cases. So, absolutely, that's an area that we highlighted in the audit. Can you share some of those figures? Yeah. So, 
also um, in seventeen in eighteen nineteen um, there were three hundred and forty one cases appeals that were handled, and out of those three hundred and forty, there was a hundred so three hundred and forty one. There were one hundred and eighty four that were conceded by the Education Authority. One hundred and eighty four conceded. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. And we, as an audit team, felt that was considerably high, and it indicated that there one was an issue. Um, there was an yeah, issue yeah, around the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. As I say, it's one of our findings and it's one of our recommendations. But, uh, and it's included in the improvement work yeah. going forward. Did that not red flag anything? It did to us as an audit team, absolutely. Hence why it's in the mm -hmm. findings and we have a separate... Uh, Prior to the audit, how, how in 2018-19 were one and two yeah. appeals being conceded and no one anywhere thought this was a red flag? And, and also, Chair, the, the stress of that yeah, placed on a parent yes. who may not be equipped mm -hmm. yes. to deal with the internal processes uh, that they've had to go through in order to fight for the uh, interests of their children to get what they should have got long before that. That, that frustrates me. I, I mentioned that specifically because my own sister had to go through it. Mm -hmm. So I know the stress on her and the preparation yeah. that had to be taken as well as dealing with uh, her child who uh, was in desperate need. And I'm also concerned as well, when you look at one and two, the cost of that process, the resources pumped into that process and the wastage, the obvious wastage, and I give one in every two, were conceded. And that will come as a, a great annoyance to many principals and teachers who have been starved with necessary resources to support those children within a country. <coughs> so th there's huge lessons mm -hmm. to be learned here. And we can sit all day around this committee and take considerable chunks out of what has happened in the past until now. Okay. But I sincerely hope that we can we can rectify this and <coughs> sort it out and instill some confidence in it for our children more than anything. And Sarah, again, I know you're new to the role and you have my best wishes and support in trying to rectify it, but I do not empty the task that is ahead and the challenges that you'll face in that. And I have no doubt that, unfortunately, this will not be the end of uh, some of the issues that are going to arise. Okay. Very brief supplementary from me on a previous issue. Um, how and uh, by whom is the health, are the Health and Social Service Trusts held account for not providing advice within six weeks? It's not it's clear. They, they go, they're not. So there's, there has been work ongoing between okay. um, the Education Authority, uh, Education and Health under the Children's Services Cooperation Act. Um, and Health and Social Services Trusts have appointed SEN coordinators because they recognise that this is a challenge for them in terms of the Health and Social Services Trusts. We may be seeking advice from a number of professionals within uh, the health or within the trust. So SEN coordinators have been appointed. Um, to streamline processes and improve timescales for the return of medical devices to EA. Um, when we spoke to the teams, this was air. This this work has only started uh, in terms of these send quarters being ap appointed, probably from about September last year. But there was evidence that um, that had improved performance already with those send coordinators, and it's anticipated that there will be more improvements in those areas, um, with the appointment of that additional resource. And it in, in an age of Children's Services Cooperation Act and joined up government, it is deeply concerning that uh, that, that delay from health and social care trusts in relation to the provision of medical advice is such a significant contributor to delays of processing assessments. Uh, that clearly does need to be explored. Um, Chair, Deputy Chair, do you want to come I in? Could I just come in yeah. on that one? I was going to ask you questions to ask also, no, Deputy Chair. No, just, just that's okay. Just that. It was just really then, and I know um, it, the, the, re the review has brought up more questions. Yeah. But, you know, how proactive would the EA staff been in following up medical reports as well? Or did they just wait till it came back? And there were varying degrees of that, Karen, but yes, in some areas. We wouldn't have been proactive um, in a number of areas. We wouldn't have been proactive um, in terms of following that advice up. It was considered that there, was, there were going to be delays, um, and um, so not always followed up. No. And the trust saying coordinators, as 
as a one in each trust. One in each trust, yeah. yeah. And that has definitely improved in terms of even the staff in our teams and our offices having somebody to contact and Lee is with. So it's definitely an improvement, yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay, uh, Robin and then Justin to finish. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I was going to refer to William and point Justin made uh, earlier about uh, culture. Uh, but can I ask you, um, sir, is it your responsibility to accept the ten recommendations? And yes, it's your responsibility. Fine, uh, that's grand. Can I ask you about number ten then, where, where it isn't talking about, where William was mentioning about the culture, where Justin was mentioning about the culture, where members were concerned about whether well, number ten, you know, that the culture that had applied. Uh, in this SEN area, maybe uh, in other areas. What's your schedule for uh, addressing that number 10 issue? Number 10 being the, the transfer of the the learning from this audit across the Education yeah. Authority. That, yeah. yep. right. but I think that is via the performance management framework. And I think the other thing is that it, it is also start uh, the start of the culture of improvement that where we take findings in one area, we apply them across rather than potentially them being um, siloed, if you like, within individual directorates so that we ensure. Um, so I think number 10 is very important for me in terms of ensuring that we don't do a piece of work in one area where there are lessons learnt and, f and things that can be done and we don't apply them across the other areas and that we do that in a more systematic way through our performance framework. Okay. Um, the next time we see you, yes. I'm making that assumption, Chair, and you're... I think it'll be soon. Yep. <laughs> Um, we will have a performance framework which will have dates and targets and yes. personal responsibilities, yes. uh, measurements, end date. Um, okay, well that, that's, that's good. Can I just take you, and I was a, a little bit concerned when we talked about the communication um, and reference was made to a helpline. A helpline in these circumstances, Chair, I would suggest is not going to be adequate given what will go out after this, this, this meeting. But I wonder if maybe, Chair, uh, you might think, Sarah, about a better approach, a more empathetic approach to the parents in, in terms of that direct face-to-face contact with hmm. the parents or the guardians or their representatives. I don't think the helpline is to um, substitute for that, um, Robin. I, uh, we were just conscious that we are here today having this conversation and that if any parents feel in immediate distress, there are trained staff there available to, to, to deal with that, but that's not a substitute for no. any of the ongoing communication, which I agree in terms of face-to-face. -face and, uh, and So it's, it's not an either-or scenario. Hmm. So can I just... I mean, you're going to be proactive in that field now, am I right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I suppose one of the um, chief executive made reference to some of the short-term resource that we need to put in, and we're mindful that one some of the, the one of the areas for short-term resource would be in trying to make the offices more front-facing, where we can have that contact with children. Thanks, Ron. I think those are pertinent points in relation to the first one in terms of. Um, regular update and substantive update to the committee um, with detailed um, performance metrics attached to the 10 key recommendations. Can you give us an idea as to how soon you could return to the committee with more uh, robust framework for the implementation of those recommendations? Our original plan for that chair had been um, the, end the end of March. March. Okay. And in terms of parental engagement, I think that is a very um, pertinent point, Robin, in terms of the importance of that. Um, I presume there are families of 1,070 children, who, or sorry, 676. So it is not inconceivable that you could hold engagement um, with parents. I know in response to the opposition to the proposed reduction of send their three hours to part-time uh, Parents for Equal Education Coalition was 
established mm -hmm. and has been engaged with around some of these issues, it, it may be well worthwhile in seeking to engage with the Parents for Equal Education Coalition. You know, I'm sure you have contact details for that, but if we can be of any assistance in that regard or with facilitating engagement with parents, we're, we're more than willing to do that as well. Okay, yeah. Thank you. That's appreciated. Um, Justin? Yes, thanks, Chair. Just finally, um, look, we've talked about, a lot about the performance process, databases, um, metrics, systems, all the hard stuff. Culture, I'm going to talk about culture again. Culture is the soft stuff, and the soft stuff is the hard stuff. Um, it's, a, it's an abstract and analogous, analogous, analogous term. And changing culture in organisations such as the Education Authority is no easy undertaking. And I would impress upon you the importance of maybe appointing an, an external consultant to guide you in, in, your, in that work. And the bedrock of a company's culture is the company's values. And they're not about, values aren't about writing words on the wall. Their values, if embraced properly, they guide your behaviour and drive your performance. So I encourage you to seek advice on that. And your values must be interwoven into every aspect of your, of your organisation's being. That doesn't happen by just putting them on the wall. It happens by discussing them regularly. Um, I want to thank each of you for appearing before us today. It's been tough, tough for you to sit where you are today. And um, we appreciate your honesty and your endeavour and your determination to put things right. And we wish you well with major tasks you all face. Thanks for luck. Okay. Any other members, final comments or questions? No? Okay. Building on, uh, to conclude and building on what, what Justin has said there, um, and in his earlier, earlier identification of the mission of the Education Authority, deliver a quality education for every child, openness, transparency. I think your evidence and your engagement with the committee today has been in line with that mission. Um, we thank you for that. Um, we welcome the apology that you've given to families affected. Uh, we welcome the action that you've taken to establish the extent of the failure to assess and support children with special educational needs and the urgent actions that you've put in place to progress those assessments and, and the delivery of that support. Um, but there are further questions um, that perhaps even you can't answer that we need to pursue um, with other um, bodies and I think more than one MLA has suggested today that a full independent review of the Education Authority uh, is necessary to fully re-establish confidence but I, I, I thank you for your openness, your transparency and the, the action that you, you have taken to do all you can to restore that confidence to the extent that you can do um, on this particular issue, and we we will seek a, a soon future uh, hearing with you to hear exactly how those ten recommendations are being progressed. Okay. Thank you, officials. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, members are members content for us to take a very, very brief comfort break before we, we close up proceedings today? Yeah, is that okay? You're in 30. Okay, okay. members, we're back in uh, public session. Can I ask the, the clerk to initiate our, our recap of actions from that uh, evidence session? Mr. Chairperson, if I've understood correctly, the committee wants to write to the Education Authority. Um, we're seeking an update on the time scales and the performance framework. And I anticipate we'll be getting that as a briefing at the end of March, as the Chief Executive indicated. I think we're also probably asking about uh, education psychology um, uh, service and um, looking for, I think the Chief Executive indicated they were considering a review of that, so we're looking for the details, terms of reference, time scales. To, to speak review. to that briefly, Clark, my, and, and it was a genuine misunderstanding clearly, but my, my question was. Given the, the areas of responsibility that have been exposed as so systemically inadequate, what, what other areas fell under that managerial responsibility? And one of those is the allocation of educational psychology, and it will be a number of other areas as well. So it will be meritorious to get an update with regards to any review into those particular areas as well. Thank you, Clark. Uh, additionally, then, um, uh, we would ask the Education Authority about its plans to improve uh, parental engagement around the SEND statementing process. 
And then I think is the committee also wanting to write to the Education Authority Board uh, asking it for its overview of these matters, <coughs> particularly around the internal audit functions. So there would have been uh, members like in the Assembly to explain there's an internal audit function so that I will be audited every couple of years. They go and look at whatever money I spend as the uh, part of the committee and they look at my correspondence and how I look after it and that kind of thing. So there would be an audit, a program of audits. So the question there would really would be why wouldn't this have been picked up by the program of audits uh, which the, <coughs> or the internal audit function was doing? And that, I think, is a question for the board. I would, yeah, I would agree that if members agree it, but I would also add to that that we invite the EA board chair, the EA board audit committee chair, and the EA board children and young people services committee chair to the committee to update the committee with regards to their response to this audit report. Okay. Members content? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. okay. Very good. Also, writing then to the departments. Um, asking it uh, whether or uh, what its plans are to investigate health and social care um, delays, so delays in the interaction between the two. You can see in the information that I included at, here we go, uh, page 131, um, the chair was actually referencing this earlier that the predecessor committee took a joint briefing from Education and Health in 2016, where they talked about the uh, SEN cooperation groups. So we've been sort of down this road a wee bit before, so it's basically an update on that and uh, the issues around uh, health and social care delays. Um, also, um, what, is, is there a briefing scheduled on that, or are we requesting one? Uh, okay. you, or, sorry, sorry your, your, your proposal was to write to seek an update Indeed. in relation to that. Um, I, I would also propose that we invite the Minister and the Permanent Secretary of the Department to the Committee to respond to the, the findings of the audit report and um, perhaps <coughs> they can, part of that response can be to detail how education and health are cooperating to address the delay in the advice providing process of the <coughs> assessment. Our members content with that. Mm -hmm. Clark, about, we are scheduled to receive a briefing next week with regards to the Department of Education SEN framework. The new framework, the new framework. The five stages becoming three. I mean, it, I would hope that it might be viable for the, and, and this can, it can be time bound, um, but that it would be possible for the Permanent Secretary and the Minister to perhaps attend that meeting to respond to this report. Okay and then move on to the, the SEND framework, which is extremely related, and include reference to enhanced cooperation between education and health as part of that assessment process. Okay. Are members content? Yeah, agreed. I can ask them. Yep. Yeah, Let's okay, okay um, thank you. Right, and uh, I think perhaps also, do members want to write to the department just asking about the treatment of the breaches of the statutory timescales? because they, the evidence that the committee has been presented with is yes, they have been breached. So what are the consequences, legal or otherwise, for that? Yep, yep agreed. Very good. That was it, I think. Chairperson, also there is a draft press release. Can I just, just before we finish, yeah, Rob. I would like to try and understand it. I know they said there was an empathetic, they would have an empathetic communication. Um, earlier it was, uh, well, there's a helpline. Mm. I really don't think helpline in these circumstances is sufficient. Mm. I really would like to try and understand now how they're going to actually deal with the the empathetic contact. Okay. The yeah, given guardian. Yeah. Whatever. Given that we've raised that by yourself, Robin, with them today, I think it would be appropriate for a written request for an urgent written update yeah. from yeah. the Education Authority with regards to how they will enhance adequate engagement with parents around these findings. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, Deputy Chair, Carmel. Should we write to the Minister or will we wait to the command of the meeting to um, raise with them around what most people have raised here today about an independent yep. aspect of this review? Do we ask at this stage, because the review maybe has been done or the audit, for independent oversight even? And then, so I don't know if we want to I think we can include in the written correspondence to the Department of the Minister requesting attendance next week. Because okay. uh, yeah. uh, 
I know Morris referred to that as well, Chair, but the fact that we have agreed that they are coming back to give us a report at the end of the month mm -hmm. on their progress, and it really is whether or not I'm suggesting is perhaps that whether we're satisfied with the report progress at that stage, then we might make a decision on an independent review. I th yeah, well, two things, I suppose, Ron. One, I think our, our question to the minister would be, does the minister consider an independent review necessary so we don't need to prejudice a committee position as such other than a question? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think the, um, the sincerity, the comprehensiveness yeah. of the uh, existing e EA um, leadership with regards to actioning yeah. these recommendations so. is not in doubt. Um, it, it, there are, however, wider questions that that are very difficult for them to answer. That I think has um, prompted questions so, with regards to independent review. But I, I, so so I, th I think they may even be two different things to a certain extent. But yeah. they can be further considered. And I think what we're proposing is that we ask the minister does he consider it necessary, Karen? Just yeah. for, that we're ensuring that we are capturing it, yeah. the, the yeah. true and real yeah. picture. Um, I think you know what has been done so far seems to be comprehensive, but you know Robin's pointing out parental and that you know and yep. all our stakeholders, which I had mentioned, the Children's Law Centre and the Commissioner, you know, it would be very important that they're involved as well. So, and I mean, the, however um, <coughs> comprehensive the audit has been and the commitment is to actioning the recommendations that have been identified, it it can't. And it hasn't asked how that developed or some of the wider questions around that as to whether it pertains to other areas. So uh, there are there are follow up matters for us here in that regard. Other actions, Justin. Clark. Sorry, Justin. Yeah. Um, just back to the issue I was focusing on. That there questioning the case was um, culture, and I would like to outline how they propose to change the organisation's culture. The explanation is how they, how they are going to I, go back to the undertaking, because that's no mean task. Um, I, I, I keep my comment on that brief, not least given previous um, advi advice and guidance, but the, the findings uh, focus quite um, significantly on managerial practice, but then also referenced culture. Um, so. I think it's a pertinent question. Um, we'll submit it. Um, but it, it, yeah, the it, it was there was a slight contradiction there in terms of the identification of managerial practice or the lack thereof, and also a, 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 and also acknowledgement that there was instances of good practice from staff despite um, limitations. But then it did also in the recommendations propose a need for cultural change as well. So I think we, need, we definitely need to draw that out further, Justin. So it, it's a very worthwhile Culture is all important. Obviously, culture yeah, no. is the good pieces yeah. and the bad pieces. But Absolutely. Involve that culture so it, 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 yeah. it embellishes only... Yeah. You, Chair, what, 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 we possibly have a breakdown of the areas uh, to give us a, a sort of a map of where their feelings really have been. In the offices, yeah, yeah. I, th I think reference was made to all five offices, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Chairperson, I'll definitely ask for that. Yeah, uh, I suspect the answer is going to be no until the process is concluded. But no, we've we'll asked the question. Okay. You let you proceed, Clark. There well, with no, further action. I, I think that was that was that it. Us? Yeah. Uh, there's also a draft press release if their members are content. How do you, how do, how does a, a committee agree? A press release? Do all members have to agree it, or I, I would do you like read it, it? Or I would like it if they did. If they if they read it and all uh, unanonymously agreed it, that would be. William good. said it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's William's fault. If it's necessary, not. <laughs> we can vote. But I'm I've not. I've read it. I'm content I'm with content. it. Yeah, content. members yeah. Content. content. Okay. Yeah. Content. Julie. I'm Rose. I think you'd be content. Take a moment. It's take William's a fault if you're not. A Have a glance. Uh, Have a glance. Take a moment yeah. Any other? Um, whilst we're just considering that, any other actions, Clark? No. I, I think that was that was that. Okay. Um, members. So and, that was, uh, okay. Thank you. We have a short uh, correspondence item to clear here, then, Clark, yeah, as so well. Just in, uh, yeah. 
in terms of, um, sorry, the Shared Education then, is the committee, to, is oh. committee are content to defer? Yep. Agreed. Yeah, thanks, Chairperson. And then it's correspondence line. Yep. Okay. Do you want to speak to correspondence, Clerk? Please, uh, Chairperson. So if members uh, turn to uh, page 357, there's the summary note of the 11 <laughs> items that we received. Um, if members are content to dispose of them as per the covering note, um, and uh, with the following exceptions. So the first one, uh, yeah, 7.3, this is at page 365. This is about pupil work experience. So the Education Authority has come back with an answer. I'm not sure that I, I think they've really answered the question about what has changed. I also I looked up the guidance and I'm struggling to understand what, what the issue is. So members can tend for Clark to write again, try to get a better answer, a more fulsome answer out of the, um, Education Authority, and perhaps even if members can help the clerk out here, is there a particular thing um, that uh, was uh, troubling the schools in question? Maybe they can come back to me afterwards. But in the meantime, yeah, I'll write. Members, wait, members maybe take a closer look at the EA response that's on page 367, I think it is, clerk. Yeah. Yep. Um, and we can come back to that at a future meeting. Content? Uh, I'm content. Robin, yep. I think the chair of the problem is that they want pupils out for work experience at various levels. They want to place them in different organisations as close to what the pupil actually wants. Mm -hmm. Not always possible. And within the placements there's very often no structure of what actually um, th there is a signing up but I've I take I have one at the moment, I take them all, I take them on the basis of work experience and I place an emphasis on work. I don't believe that everybody that takes a, a pupil takes them on work experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, well we can, it's a very important area of provision so we'll, we'll digest the uh, response and we'll return to that members. Okay, go in terms of the others then, 7.7 um, .7, which is at page 385, it's from the Ulster University, they want to come along and brief on um, their report on teachers attitude to digital skills. So I put that into the draft forward work programme if members are content mm -hmm. to that briefing. Yeah. Clark, yeah. content that I proposed the addition of MTech Academy to mm -hmm. that session yes, as well. You did. Members content with that, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, also then at 396. Some correspondence I suggest inserting um, after the committee is very clear that the onus is now firmly on the, on the Education Authority and Department of Education to ensure that the right policy systems and people are put in place allied with the necessary cultural change to ensure that a situation like this does not arise in the future. So we'll insert yeah. uh, allied with the necessary cultural change. Content with that, yep. Okay. Just get and say agreed. Yep. Agreed. Can you say agreed? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay, members. Clark, you want to proceed with correspondence there? Yep. So at page 396, a letter from employers for child care asking to brief the committee. I've um, preliminary... Um, yeah, arranged this that they would brief alongside early years organisation. Um, yeah, and uh, just for members' information, the department contacted me last week saying they wanted to brief the committee on around the 27th of May on changes to preschool entitlement. So this is one of the questions. Okay. I think it's linked to universal criteria. credits okay. and the other criteria. So 27th of May, um, okay. it's in the, the draft. If members are content. Okay. Good. Great. Then we have a... Uh, yeah, page 397, we've dealt with that. Uh, the, the page 595, uh, it's a memo from the EU Affairs Manager on the Interparliamentary Forum on Brexit. I think, Chairperson, I think I'm right in saying that Brexit appears to have a limited relevance for education. There was an issue around the allocation of some additional money for the Education Authority. But that turned out to be around currency um, exchanges. I think uh, Ms Mullen asked that question. So are the members content? for uh, the clerk to uh, write to the department just to confirm the limited relevance that Brexit has for education. Or the, the relevance or the Brexit relevance. has for education. Indeed, to confirm the relevance, <laughs> um, yes. I'm conscious schemes like Erasmus, for example, but I presume that that falls to the Department of Economy, given that it is primarily higher education, although not exclusively. So no, exclusive. um, perhaps we could reference the significance okay. for the Erasmus yeah. programs. Ryan, well, let, let's not, yeah. Ask okay. What, what's going to happen. Yes, Chair President. And then finally... Uh, oh, sorry, excuse me. Yeah. Right. Shared education where it's cross-border. How does it break it impact that? Well, there was... Uh, we were hoping we were going to get an answer from members today. There was actually something in the news yesterday that apparently it looked like 
some schemes are going to continue for a further number of years. So um, those are the many questions that I will seek an answer to uh, okay. from the department. And shared Agreed. Members are content. And then finally, St Dimna's uh, County Tyrone has uh, invited the committee to come and see their work on nurture provisions. So um, maybe we'll try and schedule that in the autumn. Because if you look at our forward work programme, it is kind of full. I would urge members to um, agree to this because this is actually a, an unfunded um, nurture um, program within St Dimna's and there's amazing work um, going on by Susan and the staff there in the school. Um, and I think she would greatly welcome us um, there to, to see it and see what they do. Okay. Okay. Do you good? Yeah. Does that move us on to forward work programme, Clark? Person, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, can I refer members to the draft forward work programme on page 602? Uh, Clark, do you want to speak to items that we need to get agreement for? So, Chairperson, members have helpfully suggested quite a lot of things to do. And so I've then filled out our, our dance card to the 1st of July, and it is full. So if members are just, I'll just drive you through the main ones. I'm thinking that we'll go to Curry and Edenbrook Primary Schools on the 22nd of April. So that would be in the afternoon after the meeting. We'd have our meeting, um, and then we'd nip out at about maybe half one, two and uh, try and get to both schools. So generally what I'm trying to do is do these visits where they're handy, where they're in Belfast, on a Wednesday afternoon, rather than any other time, if that works. Also, uh, the visit to Lockshore would be on the 6th of May, again in the afternoon after the meeting. Um, I'm suggesting that we have our informal stakeholder event on emotional health and uh, mental well-being on the 13th of May in Parliament buildings from 6 to 9. So like, it's all there in the Forward Work Programme. Um, members were very concerned about emotional health and mental well-being. Um, you wanted an event, good idea. The um, department is in the process of developing this framework. Good idea to talk to the stakeholders and see what they want. So I think an evening event, 6 o'clock to 9, be in Parliament buildings. It is an, an awfully long day for members, I would know that. Could that um, in any way be adjusted to the 12th of May, potentially? That would make it a Tuesday, so then it would clash with plenary. And the problem with plenary is there may be votes, um, but I'm in members' hands Have some here. difficulty with Wednesday the 13th of May. It doesn't have to be that day. So okay, we'll come back. Day. We'll maybe come back with a, 20th. a date on that. Do we, members prefer the 20th? Cause oh, it, I mean, it's, it's a week after. If it's, if it's no problem with the chair, then so did it, but do you want to just I'll speak, I'll speak, Clark, I'll speak to you about proposing a couple of other dates, if that's okay, yeah. Okay, fair yeah. person. Right, uh, then we have uh, an informal meeting with sectoral bodies on now, Tuesday the 19th of May. Uh, that will be 12.30 to 2. So conscious that uh, members are often treble booked now with their all party groups. But um, yeah. that's what we're trying to do. The last two Tuesdays for um, informal meetings. And that leaves you the first two Tuesdays of every month to do your uh, all party groups. So the uh, suggestion is that we would go to the City of Derry and the County of London Derry on uh, the 3rd of June for our meeting. Um, so that we might meet in Oak Grove. Uh, or Triax. He's mine about the snow that day. Do <laughs> <laughs> you not just do it down here? It's handy for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to Strabane the next week. And then I'm not going to Strabane, listen. Week. Uh, well, <laughs> um, I'm going to meet in Tilly, I'm not going to Strabane. <laughs> also suggesting that we go to Oma, um, plus a visit to Strull and Oma Sure Start yeah. on the 17th of June. Okay. Again, Are okay. these all Wednesdays during yes. the day? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we would be there, we'd have our meeting there in Oma, okay. and then we would. Um, you. Okay. Go around Stroud and have a look. And I'm also suggesting a visit to Sia, which is down in um, Titanic Quarter. Uh, no, it's Claremont Dock. Uh, okay. It's near there, so it's first of July. And again, that would be in the afternoon uh, after our okay. meeting. And the department has contacted me and asked to defer the common funding scheme brief till sometime in the autumn. So there's an awful lot to look. I, I filled in an awful lot of things there. So if members have a good look at those, and if the dates really don't work, just say so, and they're very easily changed. Okay. Chairperson. Robin, we're going to have to get some East Belfast diary dates in here or we'll be getting into trouble. Um, no problem. Um, okay, members, any other business? Yes, just one, just one thing. Ahead, um, yeah. just, uh, with the, yourself at the clerk will know. Um, has anybody ever raised the question with the Department of Education with regard to the policy in round hold, uh, hostings? Uh, uh, I, I, I was involved in a... Just, it just came to me today that I was involved in a bit of a debate locally in this, but there's just certainly an unequal uh, adherence to the policy. Uh, there is a policy, there is some guidance, but we need some clarification on that because it's definitely not being adhered to and it's probably not fit for purpose. Um, so a couple of heads have, have raised that with me. 
Obviously, you're looking to write to the department asking what yes, the guidance is on hustings, political hustings in schools. Yeah, yeah, and there'll be no cues about it. Yeah, and, and then go. further than that, then to see if it's been, if, in terms of whether they're following it and what happens with it, you know, if it's, if it's been followed or not, it's okay. Yeah, right. I had raised it, Robbie, during yeah. the last election because oh, okay. we find disparity. Yes, yeah, that's, that's what I think there's disparity, yeah. yeah. Justin, Justin. Justin, okay, go very ahead. serious matter to close on. The Italian government has closed all schools. Right, okay. And so we need a strong yeah. and uh, unambiguous direction from our education minister in relation to school trips to Italy. Well, look, we've, we've we presented, we're inviting the education right. minister to take an opportunity to respond to this committee next Wednesday on the findings of the ASEAN audit report. We're inviting him to give us urgent written guidance in relation to these matters, um, and we'll keep the members updated as to the response. Okay. Members, date of next meeting then is Wednesday, the 11th of March, 9:45 a.m. in Room 30, Parliament Buildings. Uh, I put the question that the committee meeting does now adjourn. Members agreed. 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 Assembly, committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, committee Room 30.